Members, councillors, um, to this meeting of the Planning Committee, Committee Fakariti Mahiri, on today, 3rd of December. Um, and I welcome members of the public and the press and those that might be viewing. Uh, firstly, uh, I'll take apologies. And I have counts, um, apologies from Councillor Hills and Stuart for lateness, our Mayor, Mayor Phil Goff, um, and Councillor Collins for lateness and early departure, I think, for Councillor Collins. Uh, Councillor Cooper, an IMSB member, uh, Honek for early departure, Councillor Coombe for absence on council business, and Councillor Bartley, uh, Councillor Sayers, um, member Tohenare and member Leanne Namani for absence. That's quite a list. So I'll come to that. So it's moved to Councillor Walker and I think Councillor Simpson, thank you, second all those in favour, say aye, contrary, no, declare that carried. Which takes us, um, members, I'll just, um, we need to accept, um, and this has been notified to me, uh, as is the requirement um, uh, with a reason, and I'll articulate that reason. Um, um, Councillor Fesso Collins uh, will be joining us by electronic link due to illness, and, um, and Councillor Daniel Newman uh, for personal reasons. Um, so I will move on voices. Councillor Young, thank you. And I saw Councillor Fletcher, I think, seconded that. Yes. Um, we'll accept that. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Declare that carried. Um, now, I'll just go back to the programme before I go to declarations of interest members. We've got a chunky agenda in front of us. We have a workshop set down for 1.30, uh, and Auckland Transport will be coming to join us for the Planning Committee workshop. Uh, so, all going well. Um, uh, I think we'll probably go to lunch, having completed the open agenda, go to the workshop, and then come back to the um, confidential agenda after the workshop. Um, that be the plan. So, if you, if you we just need to be mindful of our quorum today, uh, if you can, please. So, uh, declarations of interest, members, none have been advised for this agenda and no further acknowledgements of such at this time. We'll move to confirmation of the minutes and I'll move accordingly the um, ex uh, confirmation of the minutes of our last meeting on 5th of November. Can I have a second again, Councillor Walker? Thank you. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no, and declare that carried. Uh, no petitions have been received, and that takes us to item five, uh, public input. There have been three requests. Um, members, again, I'm very just conscious of uh, the demands here. The standing orders uh, provide for five minutes, including questions. We often stretch that a little bit, and I'm always flexible, but if we could maybe limit you know, a question per councillor and maybe up to three councillor questions uh, in the public input. Today we have um, three presenters, and I'll run through them now. We'll hear from, firstly, Will McKenzie and Arvind Daji on uh, their uh, submissions on three transport matters. Um, and I have distributed through our advisor, Duncan, here, uh, their slide presentation, so you might like to just bring that uh, presentation up. I know it's a long presentation, um, but hopefully you've had a chance to just uh, have a look. And then we'll go to Mr. Laurie Slee from the Cockle Bay Residents and Ratepayers Association, supported by Fiona and Fiona, uh, I forget your family name, but um, and we'll, we'll hear from you very soon. Um, Fiona Rankin, sorry. And um, then the third presentation will be from uh, a name and face familiar to us, Brett O'Reilly, the Chief Executive of the Employers and Manufacturers Association, uh, discussing the congestion question, along with his Head of Advocacy and Strategy, Alan McDonnell. So we will commence the uh, public input and ask Will and Arvind to come to the table and make your uh, five-minute presentation, please.
Welcome, Will. Welcome, Arvind. And uh, we're in your hands. You've got the pointer there, and you can control your, your slides, and, um, and you're, you're free to proceed. Thank you, Chair and Councillors. We'll be running through this If you could activate the, the little red button in front of you there when, when you speak. Thank you. We'll be running through this presentation quickly, so it may be easiest just to watch the screen rather than try and follow on your, um, on your own screen. Um, we're here to provide for your consideration three viable shovel-ready options that would help address the climate change emergency and get Auckland moving in this decade for $4 billion with savings of 4 to 15 years and 16 to $20 billion. The options have been forwarded to the relevant Ministers of the Crown with a request that the options be assessed by university engineering departments. Option one is active transport across the Harbour Bridge. Sydney's Harbour Bridge has active transport and narrow 2.9 metre vehicle lanes. The Golden Gate Bridge also has active transport and six inch wider lanes at 3.05 metres, as does the original Auckland Harbour Bridge. However, the clip-ons are 50% wider at 4.57 metres. This is Sydney's footpath showing its fencing and this is two traffic lanes and the shared path on the Golden Gate Bridge. And this is the Golden Gate Bridge um, configuration applied to the eastern clip-on. We propose that the clip-on lanes be reduced to 3.2 metres to accommodate active transport paths, as has been done in Denmark on the bridge pictured in the, in the bottom middle. PricewaterhouseCoopers has looked at this and concluded that narrowing the clip-on lanes would reduce the traffic capacity of the bridge. However, NZTA traffic data shows that the narrow central lanes have as much capacity as the 50% wider clip-on lanes. Footpaths are already in place on both landings, shown here in yellow. The active transport paths are in white. All that is needed is a short cycle path on each landing, shown in blue. That's the northern landing. Option two, light metro airport to CRL. We propose that a light rail line is built from the airport to Mount Roskill for the 1.4 billion estimated by Jacobs in its 2016 business case. And an additional four kilometres of track is built from Mount Roskill parallel to State Highway 20 to join the rail network at Avondale in five years for a total of 1.9 billion, including two grade separations. The rolling stock can be similar to Montreal's REM light metro rolling stock, and it can be interoperable with Auckland's rail network. The route goes through land zone for high density development, whereas Dominion Road has a heritage overlay and is flanked by much single house zoned land. The route also goes through Kianga Ora owned land in Owairaka, Wesley, Mount Roskill, Favona and Mangere. Once the CRL opens, the network will be very unbalanced, with two lines and three destinations to the east of the CRL, but only one line to the west. Connecting the light metro line to the network at Avondale would balance the network by providing the much needed second line and second destination to the west and south. This would allow up to 48 trains per hour through the CRL, all from one side of the CRL to the other, maximising the benefit of the $4.4 billion investment. Waitematau crossing security. Heavy vehicle use of the clip-ons will likely be restricted in the early 2030s. A new bridge under construction can be launched longitudinally as at Pakaranga. But when an old bridge needs to be replaced, as this bridge on the Ohio River, the replacement bridge is built next to it and then slid sideways once the old bridge is removed. In Auckland, temporary piers in the replacement bridge would be built to the east of the old bridge. The old bridge would be removed and recycled, then the replacement bridge would be slid 40 metres west to its permanent location. The replacement bridge would look identical in appearance to the original bridge, apart from the lower deck. However, as this bridge in Pennsylvania shows, that lower deck would be unobtrusive. This is a profile image. Uh, the replacement has been costed at $2 billion. NZTA forecasts heavy vehicle restrictions by the 2030s. And bridge re replacement has been assessed as being feasible. 
The replaced bridge would allow light rail to reach the North Shore. The light rail would have the same dimensions as Auckland's existing rail network. It would travel through the uh, Wynyard Quarter and along Key Street, a route that rail used to take until the 1970s. North Shore Light Rail would be integrated with Auckland's rapid rail transit system with one seat travel to the airport. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Appreciate that, and thank you for uh, a, a comprehensive presentation that you forwarded earlier. Uh, look, we'll take, uh, if we could take uh, questions, if we could limit it to one question uh, per councillor, Councillor Walker. So, um, commendations, Will. Um, I mean, great natural thought. So, question, what do we need to do to um, advance consideration of these suggestions? Um, I think you need to um, take it to government, take the three options to government and um, the, the proposals and then hopefully um, they can take them to relevant university engineering schools for assessment um, and to, to show the viability of it, basically. Yeah. Already engaged with the university, I understand. Yes, um, on the one project we have, and, but not on the other two. We've had engineering advice, but not from university engineering departments. Professional engineers are very um, media shy. They never say anything about anything. Councillor Watson, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Will. Very, very interesting presentation. And your first couple of graphics here of the Harbour Bridge have confirmed what I've been experiencing for about 40 years, is that <laughs> is, it is tighter going down those inside lanes, but there's no discernible difference in the, in the capacity of traffic that goes through. My question goes to... The, the walkway cycleway that I think you had the example of San Francisco or some yes, such bridge yes. beside it, uh, those cages can be a, a little more susceptible to, to, to noise and kind of not a, that pleasant an environment. Mm. Is it, would there be an ability to, to noise proof it? Um, and, and I think of some of the examples like the Rainbow Bridge in Tokyo, which has a similar yeah. type of uh, arrangement. You see on the image there, we've just shown arched um, barriers there. In Sydney they just have metal cages, which may be appropriate in Sydney, but um, we could have perspex or you know, anything you like to, to make it more pleasant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Councillor Cooper? Thank you. A lot of effort into this, but what I see is missing is you've got commuter rail red line, but um, how do you propose to deal with the existing and rapidly growing population in the northwest? Um, because that current rail that doesn't go to Kingu and he goes to Swan, um, Swanson um, cuts out around about 150,000 catchment. So Hobsonville, Tiatatu Peninsula, <coughs> West Harbour, Whanuapai <coughs> and Red Hills, which will have 30,000 people mm. within the next few years. So there's no proposal here at all. How do you propose to deal with that lack of RTN? Well, in 40 pages, we didn't cover the northwest. Um, however, if we had more pages, you can show that the, the, the planned light rail out uh, alongside the northwestern motorway, you can integrate it with that. So it's not planned into the bus lane? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, you can integrate um, the rail into this system here. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Councillor Fletcher. Oh, thank, you. Thank, you for your, um, thank you for the presentation. My, my question follows on from Councillor Walker's that, you know, despite the fact that we've had amalgamation and fewer agencies involved, um, there, there are still the, the sort of multiple arms of NZTA and AT and, and mm. so forth. So what are, in terms of your submission to us with the planning committee, what specific actions under the delegations that the planning committee has are you wanting us to take? Um, well, well any, you're familiar with those than I am, and, and there may be something appropriate that you know about, but, 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 but all we're asking is that you ask the government to, to examine it. Um, I think in your agenda, not many pages after our item, um, there's a three-page letter from NZTA, Auckland Transport slash Auckland Council. And if you go through that letter, you can see they're talking about getting things done by 2050. So, um, Councillor Fletcher, if you have a way of taking a presentation and putting it through your processes that, that can get it uh, assessed in a meaningful way, then we'd appreciate it. Well, thank you for that. I mean, obviously, um, we, if, 
what what you're really calling on is greater contestability in the way that these decisions are made, but mm. our agency is Auckland Transport, so it would obviously have to be referred yeah. on to them for their consideration. But thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. So thank you, Will, and thank you, Arvind. So, look, we'll take your presentation and material. Um, just before we go, um, we'll, we'll make sure it's um, socialised with Auckland Transport and Waka Kotahi. We'll find a channel to go there. There is a lot of work being undertaken on LRT. Uh, of course, there's a reset that the government have uh, committed to, and that reset involves uh, Auckland Council and Auckland Transport actually being at the table at the earliest this time. It's different to last time. Um, and, of course, there's the Waitamata Harbour uh, Connections uh, study, the strategic study that reported in about oh, four weeks, six weeks ago. And the, the agencies, along with Auckland Council, will be progressing that to the next stage. So there's actually quite a lot of work that is very live at the moment in those two big um, capital-rich uh, projects. So we'll take your presentations and we'll furnish them through to the respective agencies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks for your thinking about this. I'll have a mover. Councillor Fletcher? Councillor Watson? Aye. Thank you. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary no. Declare that carried. Now we'll um, invite um, Laurie Slee and Fiona Rankin to come up on behalf of the Cockle Bay Residents and Ratepayers Association. This relates to um, uh, uh, the report before us, members uh, discussing integrated residential developments. Welcome Laurie and Fiona. And all yours, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Just as a little bit of background, I'm chair of the Cockle Bay Residents and Ratepayers Association, and I'm speaking in that capacity. What I wanted to do was talk about community perceptions of IRDs and the importance of elected representatives setting out clearly understood policy guidelines and definitions. I'm not talking about the two cases that are currently before the Environment Court. This is future-oriented policy issues. On 12th of December, we wrote to all councillors expressing the view that clearer policy directions needed to be, to be given to staff in relation to the definition of what constitutes an IRD and to processing consent applications for such developments in single house zones throughout all of Auckland. I raised five specific issues requesting elected representatives to consider them. I've been asked to focus my presentation this morning on issue two in my letter with other issues being referred to the resource consents team. I would make here the point here that ratepayers see the council as a single institution working towards achieving unified goals and objectives. We also see the planning committee as near the apogee of that institution. Good governance principles mean that we do not see policy implementation being undertaken in organizational silos. Issue two of my letter requested councillors to expedite the proposed review and plan change relating to IRDs. And since writing this, I have actually seen the item subsequently on the agenda, which is moving in the right direction. But the review and clearer definitions will bring major benefits of avoiding future costly consent applications that do not meet objectives and policies for the single house zone. It will also avoid developers investing time and expense developing non-compliant applications. <clears throat> At the core of the issue is the question of what exactly elected representatives, not staff, are trying to achieve with IRDs in the single house zone. The definition has morphed from the original definition in the PAUP of developments in two specific locations intended to integrate with other infrastructure in that area through the definition of the AUP, which focused on welfare, medical facilities, rest homes, retirement homes, etc., to the version in the workshop on the subject, which talks more about a range of complementary, misspelt, facilities for recreational, social and community use of residents, with zero reference to surrounding infrastructure or how such developments are differentiated from other apartments that may incorporate similar facilities. Overlaying that definition, we have planner statements about wanting intensification in the single house zone in order to increase housing supply and in different interpretations of planners on the scope of IRDs. 
Our major contention is that it is vital that citizens can rely on the integrity of the AUP rather than having creeping intensification against local expectations which have been based on the policies and objectives of the single house zone as set out in the AUP. Our letter was written to stimulate urgent policy debate and guidance from elected representatives on what they see as the interests of local residents and whether intensification within the single house zone throughout Auckland is a policy objective they support. If all that happens as a result of our letter and presentation this morning is that you receive my input and thank me for attending, then I would consider this something of a waste of time. If you are prepared to require a timetable for action, including responses to my other points, then it rests with me to thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Anything add to add, Fiona? Thank you. Um, questions? Councillor Cooper, please. If you don't mind, it's just a comment. Um, I'm really happy to take flack as a decision maker who voted on the um, unitary plan, but I'm not happy to accept criticism of our staff um, because they are only following the rules. So um, I just want to make a comment because it does really affect our staff when they're criticised by that are following the rules of the decisions and plans that we have made. Yes, and I think we all agree with that. Um, our, our staff are under enormous pressure um, and um, we'll take the brunt of that um, and uh, that's our job as politicians to, to wear that criticism. That's a fair comment. Um, any other questions for Mr Slee or Ms Rankin members? We've got this paper coming up. Got good support for it um, and you did... You were, you were the generators of uh, us coming to reconsider this area of the unitary plan. Um, so th thank you for your earlier contributions and your contribution here today. Thank you. Councillor Simpson, would you like to move? And secondly, uh, Councillor Fletcher. Oh, um, I was just going to say you might like to, I don't know whether you can stay and hear the actual item, but would you? are you going to follow up directly with the people? Is that is what our decision is a bit later? follow up in, in response to, I'm sure the, the staff know who the key stakeholders are and we'll be uh, notifying them of the decisions that we're likely to take today to uh, set and train uh, the plan change process. Okay, do that, take note. Thank you, move to uh, Councillor Simpson and seconded Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Laurie, thank you, Fiona. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no, declare that carried. Thanks members. Now we'll be without our familiar, familiar face of um, Brett O'Reilly, but we do have the familiar face of Ellen McDonald from the Employers and Manufacturers Association. Ellen um, uh, heads up the Advocacy and Strategy Unit there and you are discussing the paper that we're coming to later in the morning, Ellen, on the congestion question. Phil. Yes, good morning Fred. and Sorry. thanks uh, for giving us the, the time. Um, really just want to follow up on the MOT report that came out uh, last week on congestion charging. It's good that they've finally caught up with us um, on that. Uh, and I say caught up because a few years ago now, nearly four, we produced this, which is the NZIER study that's constantly referred to as the 1.2 billion in savings from congestion. It was actually commissioned by ourselves, Auckland Airport, uh, Ports of Auckland, National Road Carriers and Infrastructure New Zealand. So that lineup of groups were already ahead of the curve on introducing congestion charging. We just see it as critical uh, to getting the best out of our roading network, but also reducing that terrible congestion that we all suffer. And we need to do it now, basically. We need to start leading the conversation and the debate to get some action underway. Um, the technology already exists. It can be introduced very quickly, and it does bring significant results. So the behaviour changes you get, uh, apart from the bump on public transport, which can be somewhere between a range of about 8 to 10 per cent is the experience overseas. But just the behaviour change is around 4 to 5 per cent of reduced traffic in the peak period. And if you want to know what that looks like, well, school holidays are about a 6 to 10 per cent reduction. So it would be driving around in the school holidays permanently in Auckland. Um, the gains are significant. The 1.2 billion figure that's referred to is well out of date. Uh, it's, it will be higher now. Also, that study was only done over five working days because Auckland Transport doesn't measure congestion at the weekends. And as you all know, it's probably worse at the weekends in some areas 
than others. Um, and we are a seven day a week at economy. So that's the commercial side, but there's also the social side of it as well. So if you look at the gains, for example, we got out of uh, the, the tunnel, that it's um, some anecdotally, a uh, number of our members got at least one job a day back. So that's your man in a van type economy. So being able to tran uh, transit through the tunnel has made a huge difference to getting around in that particular area of Auckland. And some of the losses that are highlighted in this report, you know, for example, there's a carpet company that, um, that employs 25% more people, more staff, to do the same amount of work. And it's simply because of congestion. And I'd probably caution you against getting stuck in a lift because the lift companies now say that instead of getting you out in an hour, they'll get you out in four. And it's all down to congestion. So those are the sort of games that you can get. And we can't afford to wait. And, and you hear constantly the refrain of, well, we haven't got a comprehensive public transport network alternative, um, and we never will. So vehicle kilometres travelled are increasing faster than the exponential growth that we're already seeing in public transport. So if we keep waiting for things like the CRL, and that will make a significant difference, if we keep waiting for things like the various busways, light rail proposals, all those sorts of things, we'll never capture the gains that are there uh, for both commercial and social purposes. So. You know, the, there is the concern, obviously, around the social impact and the cost, so that's where you set your caps. If you set it originally in the central city, uh, you know, most of the population doesn't come into the central city. You can have graduated charging, so you have the shoulder charge, the peak charge, etc., on either side of the peak. Uh, and probably the technology will be sophisticated enough where you could do discounted rates for socioeconomic brackets and things like that. That's if you went to something like the, the Bluetooth type system or instead of number plate recognition, recognition, that's available now, the number plate recognition. The system in Singapore that they're developing, which will be the gold standard, you know, we don't need to wait for that. There, there are alternatives that we can use now. Um, so the timing of the introduction is the key thing, and really that's a matter of political will. So I've been on a number of delegations with Infrastructure New Zealand around the world, and what you see with major infrastructure projects like this is that the successful ones are all driven either by an individual or a group like a council or government or the governance group. In some cases, particularly in Canada, they have quite sophisticated PPP models, for example. And I'm not suggesting that this would be a PPP, but for example, their system that introduced the light rail from the airport to the city uh, in time for the Vancouver Olympics was driven by a PPP group, uh, but that had significant council input. So what I would suggest, and I know there's an ATAP refresh coming up very soon, and congestion charging is in the longer term part of ATAP, is there is an opportunity to bring it forward. There's an opportunity for council to lead, because if you don't lead the debate the way, for example, that you led the CRL debate, we'll still be talking about this in another four or five or ten years, and we'll have lost that opportunity around the commercial side and the social impacts as well. Uh, so, we would also offer our assistance in leading that debate with Council. That's it. Thank you, Alan. Uh, look, you, you talked about the MOT report, um, and yeah, the soft release was from the MOT, but it is a, a joint government and Auckland Council report, all the agencies, um, Treasury, uh, Waka Kotahi. Um, so, we're all, we're all responsible, um, and we need to uh, jointly track this through. But uh, thank you. Um, and just a question, you mentioned the tunnel, travel time benefits, productivity benefits of the tunnel. You're referring to Western Ring Route Tunnel yeah. or the Victoria Tunnel? No, both? The Western Ring Route. Western Ring Route. Okay, good. Councillor Walker, question. Just got a question and I understand your uh, position. Um, does the Employees Association actively uh, promote uh, travel planning for members of the association? Travel planning being a well-developed um, mechanism where industries, companies can reduce their travel uh, in vehicles. So uh, most of the, the more sophisticated operators will, will be using GPS planning anyway to do that. But the impact for, for many of our businesses is they can't plan their travel. So if you're a man in a van and you've got a job, you've got to go to the job, right? So that's, that's the issue. It's the, the inability to get around the city. Uh, and particularly on the arterials, which are heavily congested most, uh, most of the day in some cases. So, yeah, active travel planning is something that businesses take on themselves. We, we've talked about it with our members. We, we don't promote it as such, 
um, but you will obviously get significant gains, uh, reductions in emissions and things as well uh, from the, the congestion charging because it does discourage people from taking those journeys, the unnecessary ones in particular. So there are significant gains right across the board. Thanks, Alan. Councillor uh, Cashmore, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thanks, Alan. Um, you talked about having a congestion charging or smart transport pricing system based on seven days a week. Um, Given that a third of the um, traffic movements on any day of the week are for either recreational or they're, they're not essential, um, and, yeah. and the report recommends five. So could you just briefly discuss that? Oh, so the seven day a week reference bill was just simply to the, the, the measurement of the congestion that's in this report. It's only measured on five days. Um, you, would, you would realistically only implement the, the congestion charging regime on the, the weekdays, the work weekdays, I think, um, because of that social impact. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Henderson. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. Um, so you have told us, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Auckland, in your opinion, will never have a comprehensive enough public transport system, so why wait? Am, am I characterising you right? I, I think, yeah, the, the comment is that if you wait for the public transport system, you'll never get there. Okay. Because yes, sure. the yep. VKTs are increasing at, a, at an exponential rate as well, Vehic vehicle kilometres travelled. So private vehicle use is growing faster than public mm. transport use. And public transport use, while it's exponentially growing, won't catch up. Okay, so a follow-up on that question. Does it not concern you that, for example, we have over 100,000 people in the northwest that do not have a rapid transit system at the moment? Yes, it does. Um, but you will get better use of the existing network that you have um, if, you, if you apply congestion charging. So, you know, there is a plan for the Northwestern Busway. There was a plan to put a light rail up there. You could still expand the rail network even further north, or northwest in this case. Um, but you will get better use out of the roading network that you've got. And when you have the busway, you'll get increased uh, use over the current predictions on how many people use that busway. Sorry, as, if it's okay, Chair, one more supplement. Thank you, thank you. Um, so a lot of those people that live in those northwest <laughs> communities are some of the most deprived communities in Auckland. Uh, what would you suggest in terms of compensating to help people on a regressive charge such as this? So that's why you have the, the shoulder charges and the off-peak uh, periods, but also if you were to, for example, have a reduction in the, the petrol tax or the, the road tax regime or you know the Auckland transport tax as well, so you could use that as an offset. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep in mind too, we're not, if this is not being implemented today, it's possibly subject to decisions, it's 25 to 28, so... Yeah, we've, we've pushed for a quicker time frame than that, I know, I know you Yeah. Um, thank you. And lastly, Councillor Fletcher. Well, thank you, Ellen. And um, like me, you've been around quite a while on this issue. Um, it's always been controversial. But I, I'm just going to remind you that this has been around that I'm aware of as long as it is since the introduction of water pricing in Auckland. So we, we're talking, you know, some 20 odd years ago. And that was hugely controversial. But now, and especially during the water crisis, um, everyone just accepted that, that water pricing and user pay on utilities like that was highly successful. So what do you say to the Auckland Council and the legacy councils as to why we have been such poor advocates on this issue? And I agree with you that we'll always be in catch up mode because of population growth and everything else. What would you see as the most effective strategy going forward to engage a government of all colours, you know, I'm not singling anyone out, um, that seems not to want to touch anything that is potentially toxic. Yeah, it is a bit of a political lightning rod. Um, and, and I think if you go back to the CRL example, where um, business threw its weight, its considerable weight in behind the lobbying for that, and the business groups that I mentioned that commissioned this report, they would all add their weight to the arguments, as I think the Chamber would as well, although it's hard to speak for Michael because you're never quite sure what he's going to say next. But... Um, you know, those business groups would help with the advocacy for it, uh, certainly willing to lead it if that becomes necessary, but really politically it, ha it has to be the council, I think, that lead this um, if you're going to have it introduced for Auckland for the good of all Aucklanders, and it, it is for a greater good, because, yes, there are some social impacts, you can offset those, 
Um, if you really wanted to grasp a stinging nettle, uh, you could use it as a revenue raiser to fund your public transport network as well. Um, and that's, that might be very politically unpopular, but if you were, for example, bringing in 200 million a year in congestion charging as revenue, you know, there's a billion dollars a year you can put to your public transport. Well, what we prove with water is that it has really good conservation outcomes. It does. Yeah. And I think we might have a similar parallel here. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, if you could pass regards to Brett, and thanks for your submission here today. Um, it's consistent with the infrastructure. Um, um, and apologies from Brett. Sorry, I should have started with that. He's yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, look, thank you, appreciate it, um, and of course you're a key stakeholder in this and you'll be travelling uh, with us on this uh, journey prior to us making any decisions uh, on any certainty of, of, de of delivery of uh, congestion charging. Somebody would like to move Councillor Watson and... Um, sorry, I, sorry um, I did actually, actually... Can, can I take Councillor Watson and Councillor Simpson, please? Sorry, Councillor Mulholland, I was asked that before. I'll take Councillor Simpson, Councillor Simpson, Councillor Mulholland, with a vote of thanks for Ellen and the EMA. Thank you, Ellen. All those in favour say aye, contrary no, declare that carried. Thank you. Uh, members will now go. Well, I welcome Member Honick and Member Taitri, who's just uh, popped up. Welcome, Member Honick. And um, so member, members Honnick and Taipari are standing in for uh, members Tol Henare and Leanne Namani today on behalf of the Independent Māori Statutory Board. Um, now, we will go to uh, public input? No? no local, local board local input? Board. <laughs> local board input. Uh, we have one request, and that's from uh, Mr Troy Churton on behalf of the Oraki local board, Oraki local board, and this is also an integrated residential developments. Uh, welcome, Troy. Take you five minutes now, thanks. Greetings. Yep, back again, you may recall a few months ago, and starting off with this thing. Um, so you've got the item 14 agenda report, which endorses option three, and I'm here to support that endorsement. You've been asked as a planning committee to endorse a plan change which amends IRD provisions uh, in residential areas. The specific thing that I'm advocating for, the Oraki Local Board is advocating for, and it seems many other boards have since uh, understood and are advocating for, relates to IRDs in single house zones. So there on the screen, what we've put together, is that it's important for you as a planning committee, I think, not simply to endorse that there be a plan change, but to, as governors, and as I would expect of fellow governors, to set the policy setting for that plan change and not leave it up to planning staff. The policy setting that we're advocating that you adopt in endorsing a plan change is that uh, uh, integrated residential development proposals in single house zones always are explained uh, in policy and status statements as being non-complying, not discretionary types of activity. And point two, that those such of proposals, IRD proposals, will always require uh, local board input uh, through that particular part of the um, Local Government Auckland Council Act. Now, that's more a matter of processing protocol, uh, than um, a need for policy injection into the UP. And finally, uh, always require public notification on the basis that a non-complying activity could be considered an extraordinary circumstance under Section 95 of the Act. Again, more a protocol-type matter. It's the first bullet point which relates to the policy setting that I think you as governors need to set when you endorse option three, as I'm sure you will. Thank you. You're concluded, Troy. That's it. Succinct. It's all we like said. <laughs> Thank you. OK, that's clear. Thanks. Councillor Simpson. Uh, question, if I may, to uh, Megan. So um, 
Thank you, Troy. Very fine presentation, well under time, succinct and to the point, as you are always. So, wonderful. So, um, Megan, when we come to the item, you, the item actually asks for staff to do a plan change and then come to the, back to the committee with its actual content. Would that be the time that we ask you to take on board the Oireki Local Board's view and then um, come back to us with those inclusions and stuff in the new year? Is that how the process would work? Thanks to the Chair. Yes, that's right. So uh, back in, well, 2019, and I know, Troy, you've um, come in front of the committee since, uh, was really uh, integrated uh, residential development was raised, and we, we held a workshop um, with the committee um, earlier in the um, year to bring out some of the issues and challenges and concerns raised, both by Uraki and others. Uh, so that's the purpose of coming today, is to, um, f as a result of that, to endorse us to do a plan change. We'll come back with the content of that plan change. Um, and yeah, this, I think it's the right thing to do for us is to, to uh, specifically address um, the concerns that um, Troy has raised, because and they are broad, broadly the ones we hear. So we can specifically address those as part of the content of that plan change. You can then discuss that and make a decision yourself. So thank you. So Mr. through you, Mr. Chair, I just then, in, in moving a vote of thanks to Troy and the Iraqi Local Board, I'll foreshadow a uh, extra resolution in the item around this. Thank you. We'll come to that. Thank you. Other questions, members? All good. Thank you, Troy. Thanks to your board. And uh, again, um, supported by the Cocker Bay Residents Association too. Uh, Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Councillor Simpson, moving. Have a second, please. Councillor Henderson, an acknowledgement of Troy Churton on behalf of the Iraqi Local Board. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Declare that carried. Thank you. Seven is extraordinary business and none has been raised prior with me. Takes us to the summary of committee information reports that have been distributed. I'll move accordingly. Do I have a second, please? Deputy Mayor. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no, declare that carried. Members, we've got three reports in front of us here, and um, with your uh, willingness, I think we've always discussed these are end of process. These have gone through a good, strong statutory testing. Um, the, the public, our communities, have had an enormous opportunity to, to participate, and this is end of process for the next three. So. Uh, first up, we've got uh, Jimmy Zhang and um, and and others uh, on the uh, Pukekohe um, private plan change. Deputy Mayor, would you like to move? Oh, Second, please, to this motion, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, Jimmy, um, we uh, totally respect your work. We, I feel like I'm shortchanging you, Jimmy, because the brevity that we are going to have now is because of your thoroughness. Uh, when you've been working outside of this committee. So uh, we acknowledge your, your work in that regard. Um, so I don't think you have anything further to add. We'll take the report as read. Or is there anything further to add, Jimmy? Thank you, Mr Chair. Nothing to add. OK. Well, um, there are any questions, members? Then we'll put it to the vote. Uh, the Deputy Mayor has moved and it is before us for approving the private plan change. Um, all those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary no, declare that carried. Thank you. Now, we will head towards uh, Panjama's report. Um, Panjama, this is a private plan change for um, 666. Well, that's ominous, isn't it? Great South Road, <laughs> Ellerslie, uh, the Central Park precinct, I think it uh, was or still is called, or part of it's called. Um, now, is Councillor Bartley on the line or not? No. Now, can I have a mover, please? Okay. Councillor Dalton and I, Councillor Mulholland, uh, the motion is moved to approve this private plan change, um, A and B. Um, Panjama, is there anything further to add other than the written report? Mr Chair, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you, Pinjama, and as I said to Jimmy, we really appreciate your work. All those in favour, oh, questions? All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Declare that carried. Which takes us to Joe, your report. And similarly, Joe, thanks for everything you've done 
uh, prior to getting here to um, have such a, a brief time before us. Um, can I have a mover for this one? Councillor Cooper, Councillor Henderson, moved and seconded. Joe, anything to add? Um, no, Mr Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All those in f oh, questions, members. Question, so, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just wanted to say a quick thank you to all involved. I mean, this is something that's been in the making for a very, very long time um, and houses some of the most vulnerable people in our city. And this is a huge step forward and strongly supported by the local board. Um, I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you. Thanks for all your work. And that's from all of us, Jim. Thank you. Um, so, we have a mover and a seconder in councillors Cooper and Henderson as the local ward councillors. And all those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary no, declare that carried. Thank you to our wonderful planning staff. <laughs> now we go to item 12. We'll hear from Tony Reedy. Is Tony? Yep, Tony's here. Um, members, this is on page 113 of your agenda. <clears throat> now, this is um, an open space space plan change um, and we're looking at approving that and other rezoning matters um, it's changes in, in zoning it's to account for some uh, acquisitions disposals and some errors isn't it Tony so Tony we've read your report at starting at page 113 there's an appendix there that I think we've gone through as well uh, Tony what have you got to add I'm sorry, there's one issue that has arisen um, just prior to the, or just after the agenda going out, which I want to discuss. And also um, to update the committee on the feedback we received from local boards in Iwi, which um, I referred to in the report, but we hadn't received it in time for the agenda closing. Um, so in terms of feedback from um, local boards, there was feedback from Devonport Takapuna on a mapping area, which, which has been corrected, and the chairman's aware of that. And there's also, there was feedback from the Chair of Franklin on the King Seat properties, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, he was raising matters which would be um, addressed at the time of subdivision in terms of detailed design access. Um, so it wasn't really related to the zoning of the properties. Um, in terms of feedback from Iwi, um, the Munger Authority raised an issue in relation to 2830 Pilkington Road, and these were properties that were in the prior plan change, plan change 36, and the issue they raised has be, is being addressed in that plan change 36 decision, which is currently being drafted and being checked at the moment. Um, so, And I'll write to them and just advise them that the issue they've raised was in a previous plan change. Nati Manheri uh, wish to be publicly notified on specific properties and I've been in contact with them and that will definitely occur. We'll, when we notify the plan change, they'll be specifically um, notified, along with all other iwi as well. And Waikato, uh, Waikato, Waikato Tainui deferred to um, local iwi on the issues. They said they weren't um, going to get involved. Um, that was the feedback from Iwi. And now in terms of the issue that's arisen and concerns, um, I just wonder if Duncan can bring up the map in the overhead. It's the second map I emailed you this morning. Right. The King Seat properties? So this involves um, the two properties circled, uh, it's Linwood Road, King Seat. The properties are owned by King Seat Village Limited. They're zoned as open space, but they're privately owned. Um, the zoning as open space goes back some years, and I've got um, Juliet Reynolds, the landowner, in the audience this morning, to, if there are any um, sort of background questions the committee has. Um, recently, Parks advised that this land was no longer requ required as open space, and they asked us to include it in this open space plan change, um, and which we did. And you'll see in paragraph 25 of my report is reference to it. That, um, we actually took the properties out at the last minute, but didn't remove that paragraph. The reason why we, the properties came out at the last minute was um, potential infrastructure issues, particularly relating to transport, which were raised by both um, John and Megan. Um, we've since had uh, discussion or feedback from AT, um, who have advised that 
before any re rezoning should occur, um, uh, IAT should be prepared to, to look at what those infrastructure issues are. And I know um, Juliet disputes that and, say, and says that an IT, ITA was prepared some years ago when the land was rezoned. I'll just um, ask John or Megan now if they wanted to add anything at this point in time. But So those properties were uh, initially in the plan change, they've been pulled out at the last minute and it's raised an issue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Tony. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Tony's covered the issue um, well. Uh, we have a suggested amendment to the staff recommendations to uh, delegate a decision as to whether to include these two properties in the open space plan change or not to uh, yourself as chair, the deputy chair, and a member of the independent Maori statutory board. We had previously recommended that that delegation um, is given to address any minor amendments to the plan change, but this wouldn't fall into the category of a minor amendment. So some suggested wording has gone to uh, Duncan and Sandra um, to enable us to work with AT um, and the landowner to work this issue through. Um, but at this point, our advice would be to not include it until we've, we've got more feedback from Auckland Transport. It, it's likely to create the potential for another 60 to 80 um, sections or dwellings, which is uh, potentially additional traffic that needs to be assessed. Um, and there is a significant issue in terms of uh, funding the transport for the existing King Seat development. Um, so we just need to work that through. So that's our suggestion that is delegated to Chair, Deputy Chair and Member of the IMSB to make a decision on that. Thank you. Look, that's good, uh, Deputy Mayor. That's good. Some clarity around it. So it was initially in the structure plan zoned as residential and then it was decided that it might be for open space so it was zoned for open space. And now if it goes back to residential, you have the refresh of the transport planning work that was done back at the time and modern date it to, to the current day. Um, is that, have I got the right sequence here? We'll just need to clarify that with the landowner and AT, but I, that, that sounds correct. So it's quite a substantial change, Mr Chair, and I'm wondering if that actually should come back to this committee with a formal sense around that. I'd like to actually see what the Auckland Transport says around that, because this is not the only development that's, you know, and train for King Seat. There's, there's also a lot happening at Clark's Beach, which is on that same sort of branch Linwood Road network. So um, there's not just one case in point, there's several. Can I suggest, um, I'm, I'm just weary of, of having a full report back to the whole of the committee when maybe it could be dealt with by the delegated um, members, the Chair, Deputy, IMSB member, and maybe you as the Franklin Councillor at it as well. Would you be amenable to that? Uh, if the other councillors are in agreement, yes, but I just want to make sure we've got thorough practice here, that's all. Oh, there will be. There, there, there will be without doubt. Um, um, can I just get a sense, is there a willingness for the members to add to that um, the C, the Franklin Ward councillor? Yep. If we could handle it that way. Um, there are there are implications here, and we do we do need to understand those uh, tr transport impact implications. So, uh, we need to get our heads around that. Okay. Uh, further questions, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Well, uh, to a degree, it's been answered, but I just wonder it would be um, informative for me where we have the landowner here, um, if she be permitted to speak briefly to it. I don't have any request in the public forum, and we've gone past public forum, and we can't have the public. This is, uh, this is no. Bad. It was it was not so much in that regard, but just to clarify um, the the points that were made mm. uh, by the deputy mayor. No, I, I'm sorry, members. I I can't set that precedent, and I this is um, I've had no request, and this has been on the public uh, record. I can't accept uh, a member of the public participating at the item. The place is actually no. I I, I respect your your ruling on that, but I I would just like to be absolutely clear on the background to this and to make sure that there's there's been good process. But I think your suggestion of it going to the delegated group is the wise one, and I'll look forward to reading what the results are. 
Thank you. Councillor Dalton? Uh, really, it's just a comment. Um, I, I, I support the Deputy Mayor being on the committee, but the context or the content of what he said is accurate. Um, I don't want to get a hold things up with a report, but this uh, information is what we've been a um, signal to us going forward as an issue. You know, where we're going to plan, the, the funding that we have for infrastructure, it's important. And so I think that we do need the information. I'm not suggesting we need to be the decision maker on it, but I want to be assured that as the Deputy Mayor has said, that there's little developments all over the place and they're all cumulative on our infrastructure and where we're going to place our funding. So just an, an awareness for me that um, I would like to know um, where all of these developments are going. I, I can see it's not a huge one. I understand the, the process as we understand it. It was residential, went to open space, going back to residential. Um, so I, imagine, I can imagine the angst of the developer, but... We need to be cognisant of the costs to, to us, what we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. Tony and John, I think what I'd like, rather than um, you know, a, a report coming back here, we'll use the delegated few, but we'll also communicate with all the members, uh, Mayor, Councillors, IMSB members, uh, by memo before the delegated few make their final decision. OK? Good. Is that a good course, members? OK. Um, Councillor, or oh, Deputy Mayor, would you like to move? So do, yes. Second, please, Councillor Dalton. Thank you. Uh, is there anything further to add, Tony, John? Good. We'll progress this then. Uh, all those in favour say aye. I contrary aye. no. Declare that carried. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll go through to item... Uh, this is item 13. This is a, an application for a private plan change um, in Albany members. It's quite a significant area. Now, you're probably wondering why delegated authority of the staff hasn't been taken advantage of here. It's quite a considerable area. It's not so much the area there. It does test, test the heights a little bit. So, um, and it's really a little bit dislocated from the core centre. Not that I'm making any judgment on that, um, but it is before us for our consideration. Todd is our, our uh, planner that's been handling this along with Warren. Uh, Todd, in your hands. And now it's, oh, I should also say, members, there was a, a very dense technical report. Uh, thank you, Todd, for all that writing. Um, that was attached to the report. So the uh, the, the main findings report, and then it had a very dense technical report, um, which is some couple of hundred pages, which gave you a sense of uh, the detail. Now, you may not have delved into that, but I'm sure, Todd, you can give us um, some highlights here now. Thank you, Mr Chair. Through the Chair, um, Kia ora Planning Committee. Um, my name's Todd Alda. Um, I'm a planner in the Plans and Places team. Um, I'm here to make a recommendation on this private plan change for the land at 473 Albany Highway. That has been lodged by Bay Group Limited. Um, the site is a former Massey University site, and it makes up approximately 13.8 hectares. Um, my recommendation today is to accept the plan change for processing. So, cool. so the location of the plan change is that area in red. It's uh, within the Albany node, identified in the Yorkland plan, and its location, so it's the site in orange down the bottom, and its location in comparison to the Albany village is about a kilometre south. It's about a kilometre west from the uh, Albany Metropolitan Centre, and approximately two kilometres away from the Albany bus terminal, which is the little red section on the top of the map. The lodge application has proposed that the site is rezoned from mixed housing suburban to terraced houses, housing and apartment building, including a new precinct to enable a greater level of growth that the terrace housing and apartment building zone can accommodate for. This includes increasing the heights. So I've included the heights up there, and I've got a map 
well, some diagrams at the end to help understand where the heights are distributed over the site and how they've designed the site. The heights range from 13 metres, 35 metres to 21 metres. Um, 13 metres is about three to four storeys. 21 metres is around five to six storeys. And 35, sorry, 35 metres makes up eight to 10 storeys. So it's a significant increase in height compared to the mixed housing suburban. The precinct has come with a master plan and the precinct is trying to achieve a internal open space area, which is that section in green down the middle. That's a privately open, privately owned open space. Um, our parks department currently do not want to take it on. Um, the area that is within the dashed orange line is proposed to be 4,000 square metres of community uh, well, commercial land, which is a similar to a neighbourhood centre. Um, it would it would accommodate such activities like healthcare, a supermarket and restaurants and a cafe. Um, there's also a walking and cycling route which is down the eastern side of the site, which is consistent with the local board's greenways plan. Um, so in summary, the plan change request will rezone the land, well, could rezone the land from its housing suburban to terrace housing and apartment buildings. It will enable up to 1,800 dwellings. And in comparison to what has been consented recently for the site is 400, so that's quite a large increase. Building heights of 13 metres, 21 metres, 35 metres, um, 4,000 square metres of commercial land, similar to a neighbourhood centre zone, and includes a privately owned park, which the applicant has indicated that uh, the wider public is allowed access to as well. Um, and here are some diagrams that the applicant has supplied um, demonstrating where they've put the parks and um, yeah, just their overall design that they wish to achieve through this precinct. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Todd. Warren, anything to add? Todd's covered it. Um, uh, no, I think that's, um, that's a pretty good summary. Um, I guess it's um, one of the last large sites left in terms of um, relatively vacant land um, in the Albany area, which which would be good for residential in this place. OK, um, now just in terms, I'd like to put the motions on the table. Uh, Councillors Watson-Walker, would you like to move and second the acceptance motions? OK, I I, look, I'd like to just get them on the table. Happy to, Councillor Watson, you happy to, OK. Uh, I'll second then, Councillor Walker. Oh, Councillor Cooper will second. Councillor Walker, you've moved. Uh, can I just check though? Um, I, in our run through yesterday, I was it yesterday or the day before? I, a bit of a blur. Um, um, I just stressed the need for Auckland Council to signal making a submission. So you recall, members, that we made a submission and we res we made it very clear when we accepted that we'd make a submission. I'm, I can see that Auckland Transport is, but Auckland Council at the stage is, is not committed. It's, it's just the home. It is there. Yep. Okay, Sorry. good. Fine with that, Councillor Walker. So the reds in, uh, Councillor Cooper in red, you've got that. Can we scroll up again? Yeah. So we're noting, we're noting that we're gonna be making a submission. And that keeps us engaged differently to just having our reporting planners undertake the work. Okay, Councillor Walker, back to your question. Thank you. I always appreciate your advice, Scroll Councillor in, Holland. Uh, so can you go, go down just a fraction more? That's it? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Great. Um, so the... The question that I've got is quite obviously um, this plan change will afford a considerable gain in terms of um, upzoning to the developer. Uh, I mean, it's considerable. It's just a, a huge quantum. In a situation like this, uh, are we able to um, ask for other things to be addressed? And certainly I'm um, picking up um, walking, cycling and... Uh, public transport, but 
desirably, we could have a, a really high level of uh, compliance with um, uh, Green Star and so on in terms of the, the, the building, the environmental design, the sustainability. Um, so are, are we in a position to advocate for that so that there's some quid pro quo? Um, so that's my, that's my first Todd or Warren? Through the chair, the applicant has included in their precinct uh, the Green Star uh, rating building assessment, which is, has a scoring, I think, is one to five about the rating of buildings and five being the most sustainable. So the assessment criteria that has been proposed includes a rating tool as such that you're talking to. So, for example, just further, I mean, would that include the collection of um, rainwater on site to... Um, um, you know, service the buildings? I am not entirely familiar with the assessment criteria to that detail. Uh, so, Todd, what, what the council is referring to is not just um, having a home star or green star rating, it's actually the number, because it's the number that determines when you click over to looking at energy efficiency, water efficiency, you can have a home star rating, but you don't necessarily it doesn't trigger water efficiency if it's a lower rating. So I think that's what the council is referring to. So uh, in our submission, if we could maybe just um, consider the council's question uh, as we uh, e explore our own submission on Homestar Green Star rating. Um, something for us to have a look at there, I think. And one other question, and... Um, I mean, I haven't looked at it in, in detail, but I do have a concern around the location of um, a supermarket in the um, development, given that there are other supermarkets literally across the road. Um, so is there some rationale for that? The rationale behind providing a commercial hub within this precinct is to accommodate the scale of growth. So the applicant has identified um, providing 1,800 dwellings in this area, there will need to be some local amenities for the residents to go to. The scale of the proposed supermarket, which is the, the total size that can be built, is 500 square metres. So, it, yeah. Didn't, I didn't catch that that last response there. Uh, I know the Chair, crickets just something started. about Maybe 500 it was a pounds. Commentators, <laughs> thank, thank you, Mark. <laughs> can we go back to business? Um, so, Councillor's question is: Can you prescribe a, a supermarket of a certain size? Um, I don't think we, you can do that through a, a plan change. You can't drop down into that level of detail. But look, so another we'll take on... last question, yep. and and that is, uh, in, in instances where we've got a proposition like this that offers the opportunity to get very real gains, and I'm I'm picking up on what the chair has said around the actual rating and 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 so on. I mean, do we do we go over this and and work with the uh, developer or the or the person to make them aware of a whole range of things that they could incorporate? Um, do we actively do that? The applicant has been working with plans and places for around two years for this. They came to us two years ago and halfway through that process, with our feedback, they rejigged the site and changed a few things. So they have been working with us and we were aware um, well prior to it being lodged as well that it was coming. Um, specifically concerned around the low carbon um, issues. I mean, we've got a climate change emergency. Um, I guess I'm just interested in whether that emergency is being reflected in terms of the request that we make of applicants. Um, perhaps, um, Councillor Walker, I can just answer a couple of things there. Um, yes, we have been talking with the applicant. We've got another meeting in a couple of weeks' time um, just to go through some of the issues around cycleways, um, uh, private commuter shuttle and, and the Green Star rating already, um, and I'm happy to add in the discussion around the size of the supermarket and, and so on. Um, and I think the Green Star rating matter will be notified, you have to notify it earlier that this is going to be a document to be looked at, and that'll be happening shortly as well. 
Okay, so Thanks. members, we can't actually require uh, an applicant to do anything more than what the RMA requires and the unitary plan requires. So that's what we can require that by law and by our statutory plan. Um, and then other things like Green Star, Home Star, it could be tenure of housing, could be affordable housing, all of that. It will just be through goodwill and recommendation and we just need to establish the relationship. I, I do see that they've got a pretty amazing design team. Um, so they are throwing some highly skilled resource at this, good design resource. So we'll, we'll explore those issues, Councillor Watson, um, through our submission, but there'll probably be uh, requirements and then there'll be recommendations. Councillor Walker. Sorry, what did I say? <laughs> I'm sure Councillor Watson would have been saying the same thing. But we will go to Councillor Watson right now. Um, so I'm just I'm just checking that in requests such as this, uh, these these private uh, plan change requests, even though they you know they go in this instance they go from mixed housing suburban right up to terraced housing apartment, you know, along with a big chunk of ten storey buildings, that that under the uh, what we have to have regard for, and, and if they back it up with a suitable uh, accompanying detail, there's no there's no grounds for refusal in terms of these coarse grain assessments we do, and uh, as it relate to sound management practice. So, really, if they chuck that resource at it, um, no matter how much the upscaling is, and if it's outside that two year period, even though you know what four years is relatively recent for such a, a change. We really haven't got anything to hang our hat on, have we, in terms of refusal, no matter where the, that this sort of thing is, occurs in Auckland. So I think the um, the point that the chair made in relation to um, D in the in the resolution is, in terms of the council making a submission, um, is where we can raise some broader issues, and I've just talked about some of those areas of concern that we really want to see more in. It's not as though we haven't asked the applicant previously for some more detail. This is a way of us getting that into um, a public arena. Um, a follow-up question in terms of the local board view. Now, I know this group has presented to the local board twice um, uh, with their plans. I don't know if it includes the latest stuff. It, it, it probably did. Um, but in terms of their involvement, once again, in this, um, their, their views aren't really uh, pertinent to, to our consideration today, are they? So, so the process for us to, uh, for them to make their formal views no, known to us is that, well, first of all, Todd presented or provided an, 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 uh, a memo to them some months ago about the development. But the idea on the process that we have now is that we um, wait until we've got submissions and further submissions in. We give them a summary of all of that information and then they make their views known in writing to us. That means they know the views of their community um, as, they, as they provide their views to us that gets incorporated into the planners section 42a report which the commissioners will consider thank you, uh, thank you councillor watson councillor watson you've uh, now that you've asked your question would you like to second this one well, i can i can drop out on that I can drop out. oh was it me was it or you councillor cooper uh, yeah. councillor cooper councillor watson yeah, yeah you're good Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cooper. Um, Councillor Cooper, your question. Yeah, it was just around the fact in plan changes. I mean, I, I'm just some of the questioning. I just need clarification. A lot of the things like the star ratings and tanks and things. That's really at the resource consent stage, is it, rather than the plan change stage? Um, the, the green star rating is part of the plan change that they have offered to us, so um, so we will make sure there are policies in there, well, there are policies in there relating to following that along, yes. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Now, any other questions? 
on this. It's moved by Councillor Walker and seconded by Councillor Watson. No further questions. We'll put it to the vote. Aye. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. And declare that carried. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Warren. Members will now go to item 14. And this is um, our review of the re residential provisions in the Auckland Unitary Plan. And welcome Celia Davison and Karen, Karen Power. Um, and there are others that have been working on this too, like Elizabeth Lee and Chris Butler. Um, so there's a few different sections to this. Oh, Chris, you're here. Welcome. Um, and um, so while we're going to address the IRDs, the Integrated Residential Developments, there are other components as well. Uh, Celia, are you going to lead off? Sorry, yes. Uh, yes, so I'm um, just introducing myself, Celia Davison from uh, Plans and Places. Uh, introduce yourself. Um, my name is Kieran Power. I'm a planner with Plans and Places. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, Chris Butler, Team Leader from the Urban Design Unit. Thank you all. So I have prepared a, a short presentation which is really just a summary of, of what's in the report. So, um, oh, let me, yeah. so the, the purpose of the report is just to give you a, a pr progress on where we've got to with the review of the Auckland Unitary Plan for residential provisions in the residential and business zones. We're also looking to get direction on how we progress the universal access uh, work that we've done on in the residential development space. And we're also just noting that we did present at a workshop to you in September on that. And then we're also looking to get endorsement to progress a plan change for the integrated residential development. And we have also presented that to you previously at a workshop in June. So in terms of um, implementing the residential provisions, this has really come about as a result of some of the recent housing developments in Auckland, but also in, in relation to the sort of really huge growth in residential uh, developments that's been happening across the um, Auckland region. And this has raised a number of concerns relative to the poor built form and amenity issues, health and safety issues, higher operational maintenance costs than anticipated, and adverse effects of specific activities in residential zones on the amenity values of the surrounding area in which they're located. And also, we've, um, and I think we presented this to you um, probably about a year ago, some of the work that we did around the uh, terrace housing and apartment building zone, where we felt that the provisions were actually acting as a barrier to the delivery of quality housing intensification in Auckland. So we have done quite a lot of monitoring in this space, um, and this is also relative to the work that we did um, on monitoring the RPS section, the regional policy st statement section of the plan relative to the quality built environment. And um, as a result of that, we, uh, we then presented the work that we um, took, have, have workshopped with you, the one on the IRDs, the universal design and accessible housing boarding houses and private ways. So that's really the, the main work that we've done with you today. In terms of progress, so this is a, a complete sort of list of, of what's going on. So the rain tanks, uh, rainwater tanks, we are, have already started um, a plan change and that's now proceeding, it's been notified. And this was really in response to um, the water shortage facing Auckland. So there's progress has been made quite quickly on that particular issue. And then again, the IRDs, we're, we're looking to, to get endorsement for a plan change. Boarding houses, we've recommended that that goes through um, an advocacy process, largely because again, we have this issue which relates also to the universal design around the Building Act being the main vehicle for really progressing um, controls relative to, to that. Child care centres, we looked at that and we um, came to the conclusion that that should actually go forward through the full review of the Auckland plan, Auckland Unitary Plan. The universal design, we're seeking endorsement um, for continuous, continuing an advocacy approach. 
And then we're looking at, um, we're still looking at outdoor space and outlook space. The other area that we presented to you is on private ways. And just to let you know, we have set up a council, cross-council task force on that. And we are looking, we're getting a lot of, a lot of um, interest from the different parts of council to working on this because it is a really problematic area um, having private ways and we need to, to look at whether or not we can do a, com a, a plan change for this um, so that we can get some of the matters sorted out. In relation to the THAB, we've kind of slowed that down mainly because of the work on the National Policy Statement on Urban Design, on Urban Development. There's a lot of work going on in that space and we're probably going to be bringing a comprehensive plan change to you on that later in 2022. And then the THAB zone stuff will probably be part of that uh, because it's, we probably need to look at the THAB zone a lot more closely in terms of how we deliver on the NPSUD. So we've also had a number of other topics and, and we um, had a big list, I think, that we brought to you previously. And so that list up there is just showing you that these are on our list, but they actually aren't being done at the moment, mainly because we actually have a shortage of resources and we just feel that we need to concentrate on that now, the stuff that we're doing already and that we will get round to doing these. But also they might also be pulled in through some of the other work that we're going to be doing around, particularly on the FAB, but also around some of the other zoning stuff that we might be looking at. In relation to universal design, we have put to, to you two um, options. The one option is to advocate for amendments to the Building Act, and that's our recommended option. And, and the reason for that is that we, and I did circulate to you previously a memo around the legal opinion that we got um, regarding with the, the level of success we might have with pushing through with a plan change. The advice we got is that the chances of success would be low, mainly because this is really a Building Act um, matter because it deals a lot with internal um, structures and internal amenity, it really is something that the Building Act should pick up on. Also, the other issue relative to the Building Act is that if it's done through that, then it happens across the entire country, whereas if we do it in Auckland, it only applies for Auckland. So that's why we feel the Building Act and advocacy in that space is a much stronger way to go. The other one is, the other option then, is, as we noted to you in our workshopping, is that we could do a, a council-initiated plan change. We could bring in a whole lot of housing accessible standards. But again, it's, we, it would be a very lengthy process, mainly because I think we'd get a lot of challenge to it and very expensive because of that challenge. And potentially we might end up with the same conclusion that the IHP gave us, that it really should be in the Building Act and not in the Unitary Plan. So that's why we've suggested that option. So in terms of the integrated residential development, we looked at four options. Um, and basically, we've come to the conclusion that we should prepare a plan change, mainly because if you do the non-regulatory one, which is happening at the moment, where we've got a number of, we have got a practice note, the resource consents team have got a practice note out there at the moment. There's, it's open to interpretation, it's always open to interpretation. And as you've noted from the two speakers from the public who came in today, that it, we're not getting really great results in terms of integrated residential development, particularly in the single house zone. So our recommendations to you today is to endorse the preparation of a plan change, um, endorse going to do further advocacy to the government around the boarding houses issue, which we discussed with you um, through that workshop that we did with you recently, that we agree that the preferable way to move forward on universal design is to go through a national approach, which is about the advocacy approach, and that we then endorse that the, the mayor and the chair and deputy chair of the planning committee seek that central government introduce requirements for universal design into the Building Act and Building Code. And just in relation to that, we have already started that advocacy. I know that the mayor has, and the deputy, um, and the chair and deputy chair have already been to see ministers around this. 
it is a pretty slow moving event, but you know, I, I think we just have to keep on pushing to see if we can make something happen in that space. So that's really the end. So I'm open for questions. Thank you, Celia. Now, um, I think, Councillor Simpson, you're going to move this, and uh, I just want to get that up. Councillor Simpson, what's the B there? Are you happy with that? Yes, I think so. Okay, thank you. Thanks for helping draft that. And Councillor Walker, would you like to second? Happy to second. Thank you. Now, Councillor Simpson, question. No, I'm you're, you're good. Okay, questions. Uh, Councillor Casey first, please. Comment. Uh, we'll go to question from Councillor Walker. Sure. Just so, just got a question. Given the need for us to ensure that um, some of these things, and I'm looking particularly at the integrated uh, residential development provisions to take effect as soon as possible. Uh, and I'm mindful of uh, some other instances where things have not always gone according to plan in in that respect. Are we on track to ensure that the way we uh, progress this one, that it will take effect, you know, on um, notification? Um, we can we can look at that, yeah. But I think you've got to have um, some quite specific reasons to get immediate legal effect. There is a portion in the RMA which um, sets out when and when you cannot have immediate legal effect and usually it's where it's of national significance or like a heritage item. I mean we'd have to look at that but I think it might be difficult. Yeah, Kareem, do you want to answer that? Uh, through the Chair, uh, the Council could make an application pursuant to Section 86D of the Act for immediate legal effect for the provisions because they wouldn't be provisions that had immediate legal effect under 86B, which is the provision that Celia was just referring to. That would be considered and determined by the Environment Court. Shot of that? Are you suggesting it's difficult? <laughs> No, I'm suggesting that the provisions, the rules wouldn't have immediate legal effect from, from notification unless we sought an order from the Environment Court and they approved that. And that's an application made under 86D of the RMA. And just further to that, what's the prospect the prospects around that? <laughs> um, my personal, my, my view is it would be quite a, a low chance of it because uh, while the matter is important you know uh, to many people into Auckland from a national you know at a national level uh, there's I don't think there would be much if anything in here that would have such national significance that a court would say oh this has to have kind of immediate legal effect it's that important that's my view I think it's a pretty low chance thank you other questions members just just one from me um, paragraph five and your slide uh, concerns me. Uh, so paragraph five reads, investigations into the following topics are on hold until resources become available. Now, probably this is for our director of strategy. Um, you know, we've made some budget decisions and the organisation's got to carry on doing its work. This is really fundamental work. These are matters that have raised, been raised politically by our councillors, IMSB members, by our local board chairs and members, um, and there's probably a few other things in that list too. So there is an expectation that we as a planning committee take charge of those concerns and start to address them. Now, I don't want to let paragraph five just slide by as narrative. Um, Director, can you just give us a sense that uh, we are likely to be resourced and um, that we will be progressing our responsibility in these areas. Uh, so, look, the, the challenges that we're under, um, uh, is, you know, are important enough for us to, you know, to, to tell you that, uh, that we don't have the resources uh, to be able to proceed on these matters as quickly as we want. So this is really a question of pace and timing. It's not about not doing it, it's about when we can do it. So we want to be honest with you to say that we are not able to uh, do this as quickly as uh, you probably expect. 
Uh, that's as it currently stands, and I know the team is continuing to work on prioritisation, and I'll keep working with them on that. And it may it may be um, that at a point um, we need to work with you about well, what are what are our priorities? You know, maybe we need to come back to you at some point and just say, look, this is the reality here, uh, and you you may want to help us make some di some different decisions. Um, this is not us uh, backtracking on on re on. Um, resolutions of the committee. Uh, this is us trying to prioritise when we can, and it will be a matter of pace. Uh, this won't be the last time you'll hear from us on this, <laughs> you know, in this in this nature. Um, we want to work with you on it, but we also want to be a bit honest with you about the realities too. Can I just add to that? Sorry, so just to add that we haven't actually stopped doing that work, so we're still, we're still doing the monitoring side of it because we are as we do the monitoring, we're looking at all the different issues. And we are doing work on outlook space and outdoors and outdoor space. So we are, in relation to those, there are, some of these matters do get pulled into that work. So it's just that to do extensive work on it at the moment, we, we just have, as Megan said, we just have to pace it. So we are doing it, but they aren't going to happen as quickly as we had hoped previously. Okay, look, good to hear that. I'll take Councillor Dalton because I think it's on this topic. Um, it, it was just on what Megan was talking about. We, we need to find that tipping point between governance and ops. So we are making informed decisions around the opportunity cost on savings within the, what will be the 90 million. I think it's going to impact um, not just on staff, but what we can output, and then the, and the cost rolls on. So it's very difficult to decision make when we're only looking at a bottom line, and we're not looking at the costs that are actually on the other side of that bottom line. So if that conversation could happen somehow, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I think we need to save the rest of this. I think in the new year we need a workshop on the work program, and we need to drop down just from the, the we need to delve into what sits under these titles and, um, you know, the residential provisions have a lot of subsets and, um, <clears throat> you know, we've heard a lot from our residents on areas that are in need of addressing. Um, so I think in the new year we need to have a workshop, look at our work program and the, the, all the detail and, you know, the, the resourcing that is required and possibly absent in some areas, get a clear timeline. My second question is um, relates to uh, the former minister Jenny Solis's letter at page two fifty one, um, and it relates to universal access and progressing work there. So we had the ministers in. There seemed to be a lot of enthusiasm for progressing urban um, universal design, and then it came to a grinding halt because the minister received advice from MB. MB then said that uh, MB, it had commenced work on what they termed the strategic roadmap for access and facilities and buildings. What, is, does anybody know the status of the MB work? Has it been completed? Not to my knowledge, no. Not to my knowledge, it hasn't been completed. Look, on behalf of Councillor Casey, the Deputy uh, Councillor, Bartley, the Deputy Chair, and I think actually Councillor Casey, you've been um, abreast of this particular issue as well. We need to go back to MB and find out where they're up to on that, because that letter was from some time ago. There yeah. was a commitment to the work. Uh, we need to find out ex exactly where it is in MB's work programme. And hopefully it is completed. We'll, we'll do that, Mr Chair. I think we also need to acknowledge that there has been some changes in uh, ministers as well yeah. since that time. So there could be some other opportunities. So are there other questions or is it comment from you, Councillor Simpson? Comment? And OK, we'll close off the questions and go to Councillor Casey for comment. One of the um, most memorable moments in the last year before the change of council in October was a presentation to the former Community Development Committee by the Disability Advisory Panel on the subject of accessibility. And before the panel, the then chair of the Disability Advisory Panel talked about his struggles with his partner to get 
anything to live in across Auckland. And there's nothing like hearing it from the people most affected. And here we are, and I absolutely accept, as I did when I swallowed the, 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 the dead rat over exclusionary zoning, there is another one here to swallow because I accept, Celia, your advice. It's your professional opinion, and we have to do that. But it's really, really hard to take when you look around and you see people who can't afford to live in our leafy suburbs and who, who just physically can't, even if there were houses. That, and we're, we're still building stuff, as we saw up in Hobsonville. We're still building houses that are not available to... How many, Celia, 2 to 5% of all housing in New Zealand is accessible, is that right? Yeah, right? And yet all we can do is send Chris and Joe to Wellington. Well, how about adding another thing just for me, uh, like an F? And that is that we seek urgent talks with... Well, I'm going to talk about boarding houses as well. That's Porter Williams. We seek an urgent meeting with Megan Williams and... No, it's not Megan Williams, Woods, isn't it? Woods. Who's <laughs> Megan Williams? Megan Megan Woods. Um, as a committee, and I'd like to include our disability advisory panel, because that's why we have them. They are the ones that keep pushing us from the back when, you know, when, when staff say that, that this is as far as we can go. We need to keep pushing on every front whenever a door opens. And so, happy to um, endorse the resolutions, but if we can just, just an F that invites Megan Woods to come to Auckland, to talk again, this is a new council, uh, this was last term, new council, new disability advisory board, and I think we do, we do we, I want to talk to her, I want to say what I was going to say to you, I want to say it to her. Not that you're not doing a great job, we are, but the more people who can bang the table, the better. And I think if we invite our disability panel to be part of that, there is no finer way to get the message across. And as for, uh, again, the dead rat on boarding houses, there's, this time there's nobody we can bring with us to the table to help negotiate. And um, the new, new minister again, we haven't seen any ministers up here in Auckland of the new term. And so it'd be really good to, again, talk, a, talk to Porto Williams and those councillors who have boarding houses, who have been in these disgusting places, and I know that we're doing a lot of good work, but they are still being built and people are still living in substandard conditions. Women and children shouldn't be in there. We're not building for them. Nobody seems to be interested in minimum standards. I am. And as you said, Celia, it's not about Auckland. It's across the country. So if you can add a G which would be Let's work on to that. invite Porto Williams to come and discuss the real problem of boarding houses in Auckland and, and some advocacy from this committee. Thank you. So I just need to get my ministers right here. Um, is, is Minister of Buildings and Construction. Construction. And Megan so Woods the, is the Minister of Housing. Yeah, that's the key. Key minister is the, is the Minister of Building and Construction, my understanding. That's uh, Honorary yes. Ginny Salisa's former role. Yeah. It's a building. Um, let's, it's, it's let's make a note of that. Yeah, this has been um, booted around a few times, isn't it? So we thought we were making progress when we met with the ministers. In fact, we had three ministers in the room at 26, um, and uh, there was. It felt like we'd made progress in that meeting, and then we found that MB gave advice that slowed it all down. So. Let's go back for some government political leadership. And uh, we're going to work up your G and uh, an F. Uh, Councillor Simpson, you're happy to. Oh, absolutely. Put Look, that I'll on. Just, I don't you know, want to waste everyone's time with lots of stuff to say. It, it's something that's been well canvassed, well asked for. There are two parts to this it's what we can do and what the government can do. And I think it's about, um, you know, just to back on your comment on resourcing, Megan. Um, and to you as well. I think you know that's what the LTP is for. The LTP is for highlighting what you need and prioritising the work program that goes with it, and then making that work within the LTP. So they're a little bit concurrent. Um, thanks for highlighting it, but more importantly, come up with a solution and get it done before we load <laughs> the load the LTP next year, because I think it's important, and, and it's important enough that it covers so many different, I mean, politically, it, it, everyone's supporting of this. So, um, of course, as you say, local boards, MSB, councillors, mayor and everybody. So it, let's, let's partner up with government and um, try and get it sorted.
Councillor Watson. I'd just like to very quickly support um, what Councillor Casey has said, and, and, and thank you, Mr Chair, for including those. Uh, um, and, and it probably goes to our, our, our wider um, communications with, with government, what's the best way to do it. Now, I, I still remember vividly that, that, that young man that was talking about his experiences around Auckland, and that, I don't know how many years ago that was, it's a few now, that, and that's really stuck in my mind. So every, every time it comes up, I think of that man, I think of the, the terrible plight he and his wife went through to the point where, you know, it was just about basically destroying their, their, their relationship. Now, my, my concern is that in our engagements with, with, with politicians, we, we need those people speaking to them because the kind of uh, exchange of academic viewpoint doesn't really cut it, obviously doesn't cut it because we're in a similar position now. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the answer is, but I think in instances like that, certainly as it goes to that universal design, the people that know what it's like need, need to be involved because if we're going to make an impression, it's not going to be through this you know, detailed analysis and saying all the right things, just, just as it was with me, I'd read all that. I was listening to that poor guy for five minutes that, that stuck with me. Um, so, Mr Chair, um, I think you've got, you've got a, a pretty strong message here in terms of uh, us perhaps upping our game a bit in, in, in terms of tactical and awareness and impact um, to get through to the key people um, in government and, and to get them to see what we have seen because if we don't, then it'll be another couple of years and we'll be you know, going through the same process. So I think we need to put a little bit of thought into, and this doesn't just occur to this issue, how, how we can best impact Auckland Council and our region on the key players in government, because that obviously, uh, despite the best efforts uh, of, other, of a wide range of people, haven't hit the mark in some very important areas to date. Thanks, Councillor Watson. Really good points. I think they're in common with us all. So we're just uh, reiterating things here, which is which is strong. Councillor Fletcher, I want to endorse those comments, and I I would like us to see a more humane response on this. But I think we have to face up to the fact that we have not been Auckland Council not just on this issue, but on a whole range of issues, we have to become more strategic advocates. And maybe in a governance sense, we need to think about how we can become more effective. My question is to Megan. Um, Megan, even if we somehow miraculously grow money on trees, is the issue of resourcing solely about money, or is it about the availability of... Um, well-trained individuals. Can, can you give me a little more insight into the requirements that have been properly identified um, that we will need to understand as we, as we have the work undertaken to move forward? Look, it, uh, it's, it's predominantly about um, money, I guess. Um, to either, um, you know, to have a budget to afford a, a, a certain number of staff or set of expertise. Having said that, you know, the, the staff that advise you here in this, in this kind of element um, have qualifications and, and a set of expertise. And so there was always a, a little bit of, um, of concern that there aren't enough out there. But really, I think at the moment for us, it's more about having um, enough staff to do the work. So it's not so much that there aren't staff out there, it's just us being able to um, employ the number that we need. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Fletcher. OK, we're going to do some work on that, uh, that particular uh, aspect of this, of this report. Now, um, Councillor Simpson, I forgot, did you want to go back to address the IR? Did you want to speak to the IRD matter in any way, or are you happy with the words you've got? Okay, it's moved and seconded by Councillor Simpson and Councillor Walker. Oh, have we got the...
Where do we get to with the? Councillor Casey wouldn't like us moving on if we didn't have that there. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait, please. Uh, should we should we take a, f a five minute break? <laughs> Not that it's going to take five minutes to address those words. Um, and then we'll go straight to the vote after that on that item, and then we will go to uh, the final paper on the open agenda, which is the congestion question. Take five, and we'll be back here in five, of course.
show the additional words. Uh, Councillor Casey, you're, uh, you're comfortable with those words. You're familiar with them. And the mover and the seconder are comfortable and we'll go straight to the vote. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary aye. no. Declare that carried. I think the disability Hello. panel's been put in both, and it's just the second one for accessibility, so I've just seen it. Just okay. Um, First committee's one. happy for editorial rights to be... Um, boarding House Standards has got not a lot to do with the disability advisory panel. <laughs> <laughs> they can't get into them either. <laughs> My bad, Mr Chair, that's great, thanks. We'll thanks. just remove that, thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, staff. Um, um, Celia, Karen and um, Chris, appreciate your, your work on that. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to item 15 and this is on page 335. This is the congestion question. This is the, um, uh, the main findings report as it's referred to, which was released on Monday. Um, you will notice that it was uh, dated July. Members, we, we, we have been wanting to get this up for a while, but uh, look, when elections get in the way, some things just don't see daylight. It is now, though, and it's before us. So we've got a report. Um, this was a project of work that was formally called, uh, gosh, we really create mouthfuls, don't we? The Auckland Smarter Transport Pricing Project. I think it was, that's what it was. Now, it's probably a long time since we, um, we uh, became familiar with this. We had our end of 17, I think. We had a report, it became the congestion question. Uh, that first report had a lot of baseline data, uh, summarised a lot of research. So the research hasn't just started, it had started in the previous report. And it also looked at a lot of international schemes, particularly, at, I think from memory at that time, uh, Stockholm, London, Singapore, and now there's more recent schemes like uh, Gothenburg, again, in Sweden. Um, so this second phase we're seeing today is the main findings report, and it's an even more detailed investigation. Um, and it's the technical report that was it's attached to the agenda. It was mailed out on Monday, and it's supported by a 140-page technical report. So it's quite dense in what has gone into what we're reading in our um, summary report uh, on our agenda today. So um, welcoming um, the team that have been working on this for quite a long time. Now David Hawkey, we all know, who heads up our, our gross uh, transport and infrastructure strategy group, um, he's with us. Um, David, I'm going to allow you to introduce your team. I know Azim has been authoring this report, but David, you've been at the coal face yes, of this uh, for oh, some oh, months. Well, oh, oh, thank you. So, yeah, I'm privileged to have me today. We've got Jared Darlington, who he is the PwC director and the project director for the congestion question project. I've got Brian Mickey, who is an advisor in transport um, and, and travel demand management and pricing at Auckland Transport. And... I'll call um, to have a few words in a moment. Um, Shane Ellis will pop up and say a few words as well. So, look, I propose um, just to go through a brief presentation to explain the main findings of this phase of work to you. Then I'll have uh, Shane come up and say, give a, few, a bit of a personal view, an AT view on this work, and then we'll open it to questions uh, and, 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 the, and, and the rest. So, I'll hold on. Okay. Oh, does this, uh, what do I point it at? Another button. Pointed at oh. Duncan, it always works. <laughs> Maybe Duncan, do you want to try to drive it from drive it from there? Yeah, sorry. It's not seem to be. It is a bit longer than just one slide, so we like. We're saving on batteries, <laughs> it's part of our <laughs> yeah. ten Maybe. year budget. Yeah. Oh, ah, that was gone past. Okay. So um, I suppose to give some um, background to this. So uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're here today is that when we started this work back in 2017, the planning committee made a resolution that uh, we needed to report key findings or key milestones to this committee uh, during this project. So the, with the release of 
the technical papers on Monday. This is a key milestone, so this is one of the reasons we're here today. And we also will be asking for uh, approval to do further work on this project with the partners. Now, if we think about um, congestion, the congestion question and what it's trying to do and, what, and, and what, why it started, it's really important to think of this as an ongoing journey of, of, I suppose, evidence that shows that primarily if you want to address congestion and improve congestion, you can't really build your way out of congestion. So this, recommend this was a big finding of the initial 215 ATAP work, where even with significant investments into the Auckland region and significant investments into mode shift, congestion remained a problem. So from that, the, the, there was a recommendation that work goes on with a purpose to support a decision on whether or not to introduce congestion pricing in Auckland. That could be some of the network or all of the network. So uh, phase one um, started in around 2015. The work was completed in 2017 of the first phase, in which uh, the chair mentioned, where we released a, a, a public released a report that really went through and gave more uh, better understanding of the economic foundations of congestion charging, what it was and how it worked, why congestion, congestion was an issue and challenge for Auckland, and it confirmed it was an issue challenge for Auckland. And it also had a look at the schemes applied overseas and some of the learnings. And there has been a number of schemes applied uh, overseas now, and they have been successful. So uh, it was a lot of learnings from that. We, re we re came back in uh, December 2017, and we reported to this committee on the findings of that work. And this committee gave the approval for us to go to the second phase of this work, which we'll talk about the findings of today, where you which we were asked to take option evaluation of potential options for congestion uh, charging, but also look at wider options to improve network performance in Auckland with the ideal uh, scenario of coming back with a preferred scheme. And we were also asked to examine a range of issues, including particularly social impact, uh, environmental uh, and technical and administration issues and uh, of how a scheme would work. So that work has been has, has, has finished, and I suppose I'll be reporting today on what we've found. Look, the, the main findings from this work, and I think this is a really important finding here, is that technically there is a strong case for implementing congestion charging in Auckland. And I think what we need to be really clear in our minds about what we've found through this work is that congestion is a problem for Auckland. It, has a lot of disbenefits that are, affect Auckland, including our economy, the access to jobs, the uh, has it, it, and things like that. Uh, and we've this work has said that if you really want to address congestion, you really do have to think about things that affect the demand for the, your network, and congestion pricing or congestion charging is a very effective tool in dealing with a congestion problem. So that is the big finding. So, and I suppose if you extrapolate that finding, if you want to really change the congestion outcomes in Auckland and improve the network performance, if you don't do pricing and demand management, you won't change those outcomes, it's very hard. So this is, this is a really important thing for us to think about here because literally if we want to change these outcomes, this is a, a really strong tool. When we, did the, when we looked at the options and we modeled them in quite considerable uh, detail. Uh, there was a, many important benefits for Auckland that could be attained if you applied one of these schemes. There was significant improvements in network performance. A regional-wide scheme could get improvements of 8 to 12 per cent across the network. And putting that in sort of non-technical terms, this means that you'd have the performance that you see in the school holidays all the time. That seems quite hard for us to fathom when you think of when you drive around Auckland at the moment. But if you look at the results in the, in the case from Stockholm with the applied congestion charging, it is quite fascinating. I spent a bit of time preparing for this, looking at YouTube videos of what people thought of Stockholm and what had happened there. And it is just quite amazing, really. They, they had a 20% decrease in trips across that network. And people have now got, you got a 70 cent approval of congestion charging in Stockholm because people have seen what it can do. It's quite a different way of of doing things, I suppose. 
It boasts, you get both improved speed and more reliable journey time. Now, the reliable journey time is a really important thing to think about because, as we know, when if you're travelling on different days and you don't really know what those conditions will be out there on that day, some days it's really great and you get there in 15 minutes, sometimes take an hour, you will build in buffer time if you need to be somewhere at the right time, so these trips take a lot longer. Congestion charging is far cheaper than bringing in more, more road capacity. I think at the last planning committee, I came presenting on the additional Waitamata Harbour Crossing uh, Connections business case. And you sort of could see from that business case when we were looking forward, the serious cost of bringing roading capacity on into the Auckland network. I, if I recall, the roading component of that uh, business case was more than up to $10 million if we were going to put a new crossing in. What was really interesting in that business case, and it's the first business case of, of size that's done this, road pricing, congestion charging type mechanisms were, were, were put a part of the business case. A key finding of that business case is that by applying road pricing, you could put off or delay the need for that roading capacity by up to 10 years. So that's a huge saving for, for Auckland if we can do more of this of demand management up front. Uh, it supports improvement in local uh, air quality, which in schemes overseas like London, this has been a significant thing that's been uh, improvement. And when I was in London three years ago, walking in the, in the congestion area there, I couldn't believe the air quality versus I've been there 17 years ago. And it makes a contribution, modest but important, to greenhouse gas emissions, which is obviously important for this council in terms of what we've declared as important uh, climate change targets. And most important, I think, for this to recognise that there are some social impacts. But I can honestly say, in any business case I've been involved in, this has been where social impacts and thinking about them have been more upfront than any I've seen. I think the social impact work we've done so far is the most comprehensive I've seen in a business case. So I think all the partners and the staff have, have thought about social impacts on potential volume is, is quite upfront and a big part of the thinking. And I suppose the recommendations of these reports is that while there are impacts and they, uh, they, can, they will have effects on people, there are ways we can manage those. So that's what we will talk a little bit about all today. Uh, a big part of this work and we, uh, we were asked to do was to have a look at a whole range of potential schemes, not just pricing type or charging type schemes, and have a look what was a potential best fit scheme for Auckland. Uh, so we looked at 26 options, and as I say, there was a range of options, including things like PT fares, parking, reverse tolling, as in effect you pay people not to come to the network, so we were very broad-minded in the way we looked at these schemes. Some of these schemes weren't really able to stand on their own feet, but potentially could be part of a wider transport to manage, demand management sort of package. So from that work where, where we analysed the range of factors, with the strongest weighting being around uh, network performance, but social, environmental, economic safety and ability to apply a scheme practically and flexibly were thought about, five options fell out. And what's really interesting about these options is that four of them, the top four, currently are applied around the world. So in a way it was a really quite a good menu. There was a city centre cordon, which we'll talk a bit about more in, in, a, in a moment, where in effect you were charged to enter and ex exit an area at a, a time of day. And this has present in Stockholm at the moment. An isthmus area charge where you have a, a big an area where you'd be charged to enter or exit that area, but also be charged within the area, that, that has present in London. A strategic corridors where, based on a roading hierarchy that would be identified, you are charged to, to travel down congested corridors at some time of the day. This has present in Singapore. A combination of the first one and the third one, when you maybe start with a cold and then look at, uh, at, at, cor at uh, strategic corridors, this has present in Gothenburg. And then the last one was, I suppose, the most close to what you'd see in an economic textbook, where in effect all roads across the region that were congested would be have congestion charging based on more sophisticated GPS-type technology. No country currently does this type of scheme where Singapore is starting to think about and look at this scheme. So these were very thoroughly assessed and we spent, fair to say, a lot of time in, and if you, there is currently 20 technical papers on the MOT site which goes into all factors of these things. So from that, two potential uh, uh, options were shortlisted as having 
uh, potential for Auckland. The first was the city city cordon, and the, and the other one was strategic corridors. I'll quickly run you through just why they were why they came through. You see the city centre cordon there. This is an illustrative uh, uh, scheme there, where you see literally State Highway One and State Highway 16 that in red there almost act like a bit of a fence, really. So when you cross those fence and, and, and go into the city, you will pay a charge uh, for going in for entry and exit in the AM and PM peak. Uh, so it, this came through as a potential good option for Auckland because it has a small, it, it's a, quite a small area, uh, so in effect it's a small impact on network performance, but this means it's a, it, it's a potentially a good sort of starting thing. It may, this one would mainly target the commuting uh, trips that come into the Auckland central city, and, and they, because you've you got 15% of the employment there. Uh, it is, the technology is currently available to do this, and so it will be done using what they call automatic number plate recognition technology, and that's well used already, and you could repurpose some of the infrastructure to do this. It, it would generate low revenue due, the, due, to, due to the trip size or the capture, but again, because it's actually low cost, it generates a positive uh, benefit cost ratio. Interesting enough, all the options, except for the, that regional GPS based one, have positive uh, BCRs, which in transport world is pretty good. Uh, the equity impacts are likely to be modest because there's high um, provision of PT into this area and there's also a low number of trips being uh, captured. It presents a low, it was, I suppose what really made us think about this is it presents a potential low risk option to start this type of scheme. Now, some stakeholders have said to me, oh, you know, you've got, you've got COVID-19 and the central city is struggling at the moment. I think it's really important to think, and the, the report does talk about when you could implement such a scheme. A scheme like this, you would not do it before 2025. You'd need to bring on the central rail link sort of PT uh, extra capacity first. So this is, is still in the future. So even with, uh, you know, hoping with, with the COVID impacts we've seen, hopefully we would see some improvements and changes by that time. The next one was the teacher corridor scheme. So this is where I said before you have a roading hierarchy, basically state highways or main arteries which are congested and you'd pay a charge to travel on those in some part of the day. This actually generates quite meaningful uh, performance benefits and we've seen, if you look at the numbers, this is through this sort of scheme it was fully implemented, you'd get the score holiday effect if it was in place. It's low technical implementation and operating risk because we could repurpose quite a, quite a bit of the currently available technology, which is around the automate, automatic number plate recognition technology. Uh, it, has, it has the potential to generate net revenue of over 200 million a year. Modeling around the, I want to talk about a tariff scheme a bit, potential tariff scheme a bit later, was around 250. When you start thinking that to run a scheme is, you know, illustratively around 80 to 100 million, you're generating similar revenues that you currently get from your regional fuel tax of around 150 million a year. So it has a significant ability to self-fund itself, and then you can think about what you do with these revenues. The financial cost charges on households spatially is reasonably equal because it's come across the region. But as we'll talk about about later, obviously if you're a low income uh, road user who can't change the time, there, there would be impacts on that person, and we'll talk about the mitigations of that. So there was analysis, further analysis on those two schemes were done, but both schemes were considered feasi feasible both technically and implemented, could be implemented. Uh, but I suppose when we, we, we think about what this project was uh, asked to do, which is because the biggest weight was on improvements to network performance, the, you know, the, site, the, the spatial uh, scale of these schemes uh, and the impact that the strategic corridors have made it as a preferred scheme. Now, the other real great benefit of a strategic corridor scheme is that you could implement, you can phase the implementation around where you have the strongest PT alternatives, and as you build those PT alternatives up, you could roll out the scheme. So the report spends some detail talking about how you could start with a central city scheme, and then you would increase uh, the scheme down congested corridors as you do PT enhancements, and there is uh, the indicative, um, I suppose, a pathway for how that could work. Uh, but I suppose it's still worth recognising that the central city court could be a potential first step, 
But in some ways, the strategic corridor, if you started in the centre, and the corn are very similar in, in, in effect, really. Uh, one of the real advancements, I think, of this phase of the work, and this, you know, this was a lot of time was spent on this, was to develop an indicative or illustrative tariff structure. So this was about how would you actually charge people and what sort of charges would they face and, and when would they face these charges and what would the sort of you know, impact be on them. So uh, this, this is quite key because what you achieve through congestion pricing is all related to the price. And it's really important to recognise here that these schemes aren't revenue-raising schemes. What we're trying to do is find the minimum charge that will enable a person to change their behaviour or at least consider changing their behaviour. Uh, this, this is not about putting a financial burden on people that cannot change their behaviour. That is not what this is about. This is, this is really about getting people to think before they make that trip, do I really need to make this trip now or do I, could I change it? So there, there is quite a bit of detail in the report about what this could look like. There, there is a two-hour journey window for AM and PM peak is proposed. Then you have a sort of a, a scheduled 30-minute time bands within this window with the highest charge at the peak being 350 going down to a 150 charge. Now, the reason that the 350 was, was, was proposed as a potential fare is it is lines with what you'd get in a two-zone public transport fare. You wouldn't want the peak fare to be cheaper than catching public transport, because why would you? Uh, and then there's also no charge for inter-peak, off-peak periods, and the charges apply for Monday and Friday. Now, what's really important from this illustrated tariff structure is by applying the structure and, and modelling it, you get these results that we've talked about before. And also, quite importantly, we talk about mitigations. Built into this tariff structure is uh, for for an individual motorist, no motorist would pay more than seven dollars a day. That would be it would be capped at that price because the th why would we thought of that is a we don't want to oh, have too much of a burden on on the motorist. And if people can't change behaviour, we don't want to take extra extra charges on them. So if you got if you can't change behaviour, there is a there is a capped uh, cost. Social assessment was front and mind of all this work, and I, as I said before, there's been substantial amount of work done on social, on social and impact assessment sort of thing. And, it, and as to be expected, some households are disproportionately affected, and some local, local, low incomes would pay more proportionally than high incomes in terms of their income. Uh, and we, it was really interesting as a part of it, and if people are very interested to see some of the individual stories around uh, vulnerable units, we did quite a bit of work where we interviewed 50 vulnerable users, which by vulnerable users I mean people that are of low income, can't change that time and would face the charge, and what it would mean for them and their families, and there's quite a lot of detail about that. And so we've talked to people on the ground about what this would mean, and, and this sample uh, was, was, was primarily um, aimed at low income road users. Mana Whenua, and there was some work done on that, would be impact on the access and engagement to places of identity. And there is a technical report looking at what it means for Mana Whenua in terms of would it, would it, for places that have special meaning for them, what would this uh, congestion charge mean for them? And it would have impacts. So in, if we went to a third phase, we'd need to think about that in more detail. The, the reports go into some detail about potential measures, but recognising recognises that we do need to do more work if we went to phase three on social impacts. There's a talk of a daily charging cap, which I talked before. There's talk about discounts and credits. There's also using of, of, of ways to identify people that could be vulnerable. For example, the community service card. There'll be more work required in the in, on phase three about people who are low income working type um, road users sort of thing. They, 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 the rest have to be able to do more how we would identify and use that. Mitigations could be, could be applied for disability and mobility users, and there are some uh, uh, suggestions of how such a scheme could work. But you know, there, I think there's been a lot of work done, but before any final decision would be made, there would be more work to really get the grips to some of those areas that it was just a bit hard to identify in this part of the project. 
In terms of revenue and technology, as I mentioned before, a full scheme could generate over more than 200 million. Uh, and then uh, per, per annum. And now thinking about how you'd use this to pay for, well, in the first instance, you'd, you'd, we, the, the report is recommended that we use to wash, I suppose, the face of the scheme with the operating costs. But then you could consider, and this would be a part of a future decision, whether you'd use it for mitigation measures for vulnerable users and support public transport infrastructure and services. And in time, it could be replace or uh, reduce your regional fuel tax. Uh, the technology is available at the time, and there's no there's no technological hindrance to do these schemes. Uh, I suppose I'll just to wrap up quickly because I know we haven't got much time. And I suppose in terms, I suppose what we're asking for in terms of a recommendation for this item, first we've asked you to receive the findings of this phase of work, as we are under the delegation from this committee. We are recommending that we continue to work with government on this process and to undertake scoping work of the next phase and we'll bring that back to you for decision to go forward. So uh, that's about, I think I'll just quick, quick, quickly call up Shane. Uh, oh, there, yeah, Shane. Would you like to say a few words there, Shane? So welcome, oh, uh, Shane, mm. Chief Executive of Auckland Transport. Also, Wayne Donnelly, uh, the Deputy Chair of, of the Board. Um, and the Auckland Transport Board considered this paper, or its variation of this paper, uh, at its Tuesday meeting. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to open up here. Wayne, would you like to the commence? The Chief Executive has delegated to me, um, Mr Chairman. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's not. I, on the way in, coming down the North Shore busway, flying into Auckland, not congested at all. This morning I thought back to 1996 when I was Director of Planning of the then Auckland City Council and my team pulled together a significant piece of work on congestion pricing in Auckland. It was interesting um, to, to reflect that the reasons for doing it were the same then as they are now, and, and I thought that was an excellent presentation you, you, you got today. There were things missing, though, at that time. Um, one was overseas examples that you could relate to Auckland that you could draw on. The other one was the technical the range of technological capabilities you could have to practically implement it at reasonable cost, etc. And the other was the offering of alternative modes in Auckland. We're miles ahead of where, uh, where um, we were back at that time. And, and yes, the, um, the Auckland Transport Board did consider this on Tuesday, and it, um, it endorsed the findings of the, of the report, it authorised the Chief Executive to continue to apply resources to the, to the development of the, um, of the way forward, um, and, and also um, made it clear that we, as a board, very much expected Auckland Transport to be a, a, play a central role in this, both in terms of its development and its eventual, um, eventual implementation. We see this, the, the, the congestion question uh, report as really the, 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 the initial strategic business case. And from here, there's quite a lot of development work to do to, uh, to, 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 to um, develop the detail. If I could summarise Auckland Transport Board's view, um, they see we see congestion pricing as an essential capability going forward. Um, that increases the efficiency of congested corridors for those people who have to use those corridors at congested times. That's the fundamental reason for this. It increases the efficiency of it. Now, that efficiency comes at a price. That's why it's called congestion pricing. And that generates revenues which will be reinvested in the transport system and, and, and I'd, I'd imagine eventually take over from Auckland Regional Fuel Tax. The... Um, the other critical element for the board is that the introduc introduction of congestion charges coincides with the availability of enhanced alternative mode opportunities. And I think that's a, a key part of, of the timing of this. We've got massive investments that council have made and the governments have made coming, coming on stream in four or five years' time. And, and, and certainly my feeling, having been involved in this kind of thinking for a long time, is if we miss that opportunity, we could wait decades for another to, to, to make the case to, to our communities that this is a good thing to do because alternatives are in place. 
and 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 the board also um, discussed and acknowledged that if there were any resi residual hardship for different parts of the community because of implementing of this, then that had to be addressed as part of the overall proposal. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that summarises the, the board's view. It's, it sees this as the work done by the project team as a real strong, really strong contribution to uh, what is regarded as an essential toolkit that we need to add to our capability as a transport authority. Thank you, Wayne. Look, we'll, we'll put up the recommendations so that the members can see the recommendations, which in the something in red, and I'll move and the, the Mayor will second. We'll put those up if, if the members can just start reading those. But just a question for you, Wayne, or, or Shane. Shane, you might know this detail. So the technical report, which sits under the main findings report, is proposing a subject to decisions and more scoping and examination. A tw at earliest 25 implementation of the uh, a trial scheme, I think they, the, you know, and then possibly un unfolding more fully 28. Shane, I just wanted to ask you, I've got my list of the infrastructure programs, projects that will have rolled out by 2025. I've got CRL, Eastern Busway, Third Main Electrification to Pukki, Northwest Busway, Ferry procurement strategy with electric ferries, advanced e-bus rollout, where well, we will be advanced, northern busway enhancements, 500 million there, that'll be complete, nine car train sets, uh, Watamata connections, that will be, we'll we would have landed a, a decision by then on um, rapid transit to the shore, um, commencing admittedly in, in 2030 plus, Bus network reviews, they're ongoing. Uh, you would have refreshed the network on probably more than two occasions by then. A bus shelter program, I think it's something like a 1,000 shelters. What else, by 2025, have I missed anything that comes to mind? Um, probably the other one to be aware of, which is really relevant to the strategic corridors option in here is the Connected Communities uh, Program. Yes. yes. Uh, and uh, I, I, like Wayne, I really commend the project team of which David from Council and, and Brian from AT and, and Jared have all been a part of. But the the ability to stage rollout will f really, you can make, it, it feels real when you talk about connected communities along those strategic corridors, particularly through the isthmus. Um, so I think that's another key piece, uh, Chair. It is, thank you. Let's have some questions. I think we need to enter this inquiry, uh, not that we're just starting it. Um, and Mayor Goff, would you like to commence? Yeah, uh, thanks. Look, I, I think it's a really competent uh, report and it does exactly what you are asked to do and it gives us a, a basis for making a decision. It uh, doesn't give us a basis yet to know whether we've got public support for it, but that's the next phase. Um, I, I've got two questions. <clears throat> One I've raised to David with you uh, personally, but I'll raise it in the presence of councillors. Um, yeah, c the social assessment mitigation, that's pretty critical because for a small, maybe not too small a section of low-income people coming down the motorway into town, um, this is going to be much, much higher than they're paying in regional fuel tax. The question is this, you've, you've listed the community services card as a way of delivering relief, but the community services card, as I understand it, only applies to those earning less than the minimum wage. So you have, if you use that mechanism, not included any low-income worker, and it won't be the community services card people that are travelling in in peak hours, it'll be the low-income workers. So the question is this, how much thought did the working group give to providing relief to that group, which I regard as pretty much a, an essential prerequisite to bringing in the, the congestion tax? Um, and what sort of mechanism, did you, did you give thought to what sort of mechanism you might be able to use um, to, to provide that relief? That's the first question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I suppose that I, I mentioned to you is, yep, there was, there was a lot of work done. That, 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 and there's more work to be done. 
uh, I suppose there was also considering for the working families sort of packages as well. So I think what you, you, you know, you've highlighted there is that we've, you know, we've indicated some schemes that could be used, but there's, there is more work required to really get to the bottom of, you know, as you say, those working families, working households, that this is going to have a significant impact on them. And in the, that has come through in uh, the 50 in, interviews that we've done, uh, we've got some examples of exactly that. So there, there, that would be a part of the phase three to get to, get to the bottom of that. Mm. Well, well, that's good to hear, because, I mean, I don't think you can do the scheme unless you provide the relief, but I'd hate not to do the scheme on the basis that there will be some people that are hurt by it, but then the rest of us, um, that's the price of travelling in peak hour. My second question is this. Um, you, you touched on it, but I think if you introduce a... a, a congestion tax on top of the regional fuel tax, there would be enormous cynicism that this was just a revenue grab. So how much thought did you give uh, about the other prerequisite I've got, which is um, you'd need to phase out the regional fuel tax as you were phasing in the congestion tax? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, th no, that's exactly right. I mean, and I, that would be a decision for, the, you know, for your final decision is how you do that. And some of it is really dependent on that decision of the size of that initial scheme that you go for sort of thing. So in effect, you know, it will be a case of, if it's a small scheme, obviously the, the revenues from that scheme would be low. You, you know, you want, you'd want the scheme to pay for itself a bit. So any difference, you could either make a decision to reinvest in PT or you could reduce your after. That, that is a key decision for the future. So I suppose at this stage, they, this work outlines the options that you have for, before that final decision. Yeah, you'd, you'd need to at least return the revenue that the regional field tax is through your scheme, but if you load one on top of the other, I'm afraid the public will, you know, as much as you can spend the money, I'm sure the public would just regard that cynically and probably not go for it. So I think we need to be straight up front that that's uh, what we'd do. And I use the words uh, in a measured way, phase in, phase out. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, please. Well, thank you. And firstly, may I congratulate um, everyone that's here today that has actually brought this most important issue to us. Um, and I would like to acknowledge Wayne Donnelly. I, I remember standing in this very room and making a speech to him as he farewelled Auckland City and congratulating him on the courageous endeavours that he's had and the c consistency that I now see. I mean, this issue, earlier today, I highlighted um, when we had employers and manufacturers here that we looked at water charging at the same time as we started talking about congestion charging. Both were really controversial. One we got through and one we didn't. So my question to you today, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for actually, because People liberally use the word courageous around this table, and I sometimes get a bit snorty about it because it is hard to push things over many, many years, yeah. and Wayne, you have done that. But this is an act of real courage today, but the question is, if not now, when? Because nothing I can see is going to have that fundamental shift Unless, and for all of those of us who pushed for CRL and everything else, this was a critical factor in having the jigsaw puzzle come together. So I, I would like you to respond uh, in terms of, we have a government with a big majority at the moment, um, the, the, the conditions that are required to bring this critical matter to a head. Thank you, Councillor. I suppose a, a key decision going forward in the, in the third phase is the change of legislation. So you, we can't do congestion charging without modification of the Land Transport Management Act or new legislation. So government has a big role in that final decision sort of thing. But the way I, I think about uh, this, these sort of schemes is, and I, I, I suppose a big ref what I've looked overseas, is that many cities now ha have done it. Many cities are thinking about it, and I think the reason they're thinking about it is that they've come to the sort of conclusion, I think, this work has shown, that if you want to address these issues, if you don't have this, these sort of options in your toolkit, 
You can't really do it. Uh, and I think that's the bottom line. So there's the, and I think the other thing is a lot of cities in the world are now realising that without having this type of thing in the toolkit, you can't, you can't afford not to have it. The demand for uh, ongoing transport network capacity is terrific. Unless you can modify or manage that, de that, that de need for that demand, uh, you will be caught in a cycle of an just increased costs. And I think if you've seen through the LTP or 10-year budget process that you've been working on, the cost for bringing on new capacity into the transport network is terrific. And if you don't have this in the toolkit, that will continue. So you ultimately, with these things, someone always pays, it's just who, who pays. So having a charging scheme where you get people to think about making that decision at the moment they get in their car, it makes a big difference. And just reflect on that. In the Stockholm example, it's, they, they actually got a, it's got a name for it. It's called the Stockholm Effect, where they asked people afterwards uh, what, had, what, had, what had changed and what, for them. They actually couldn't remember a lot of the trips they used to make because when they faced the price, it just changed their behaviours and they couldn't remember. So these trips literally disappeared and the network was open more free. So I, I think, you know, uh, around the world, this, this, these sort of, to this, these sort of options are becoming far more up people's minds because there's a realisation you just can't build your way out of these sort of problems. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, naturally, we have to tease out the detail of issues of equity for folk. But, and I'm often very critical of the way that we waste time in this chamber on things that, you know, are not that higher in my mind, anyway, in terms of priorities. But this this is a, it's a real circuit breaker today. And I think it's good that we're spending a bit of time on it. And I really congratulate you for bringing it to us. And I hope, I hope beyond hope that we can adopt it unanimously and have the government understand why Auckland, if New Zealand is to succeed, why Auckland desperately needs that legislative change now, and that's why I'm, I keep harping on about advocacy. We have to improve our advocacy. We must get this across the line. So true, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. Councillor Filipina. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, congratulations on this. Um, I just want to say, Your Worship, the two issues that you mentioned that uh, concerned me was uh, the community services gap, uh, but also, gosh, it's just sort of gone out at the moment. There was, a, yeah, yeah, the, the fuel tax because when that was brought in, um, that was on the understanding that if congest, congestion charging uh, was going to occur, that is going to be uh, not as well as that. So look, that's one thing. My question is, however. With this and the government indicating 20, possibly 2025, with this third stage, will we be, will the information we're collating now be redundant, that it's not going to be worth anything when we get to uh, at, at least the ability for the government to put in congestion charging? I see Shane shaking his head no. Which, which is a good thing, but I, you know, so look, that's that's one thing, and then I've got one other question. Question, thanks. Who's going to handle that one, Brian or Jared or? I mean, Shane might be able to. He just said no, it's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the the obviously the. COVID is we've had a little impact in terms of traffic um, patterns, um, but but I mean you know just anecdotally you, you know we're already seeing you know traffic ramping back up, and 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 I think that there's you know when I, when I talk to people about this I kind of explain to them that you know if, if you just kind of think about the cumulative impact of population growth in Auckland it, it's 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 kind of it's it's overwhelming really. And, and because we have a very constrained, uh, you know, geography in terms of our isthmus and the two harbours, it, it is very difficult to 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 add road capacity, uh, and it's extremely expensive. So I think that I think that 
the, the found the work we've done and the, and the foundation will be still be be relevant, um, and and, uh, and and the long term trend is, is for the situation to just get increasingly worse, and we'll see what's happened overseas, which is that the interpeak just starts to disappear, and the peaks just go get start earlier and and finish l later. Yeah, and I can add to that as well as. You know, when I came uh, back uh, last committee meeting, when I presented on the additional Wider Matter Harbour connections work, uh, in which projected we could sort of see, even with the COVID 19 and thinking about, in the longer term, these congestion conditions were still significant and that didn't need to bring on new capacity. So uh, I think, you know, it's very hard to predict that COVID effect, but over time, all the planning is that we will return to similarly normal sort of situations. So, uh, it's, uh, so it's, so long and short of it is, you know, you wouldn't want to limit your toolkit uh, based on some of some of those uncertainties around that. Okay, and and um, the final question um, is, are we doing this work? So then, if the change of legislation becomes a reality and the work gets started at central government level. Are we doing this work as per the report saying that we that the government want Auckland Council support? Is this the, the reason we're doing the work? And sorry, Chair, just to throw in this last question, but and, and it's going to be together, is that when I read the spin-off um, article they did in 2017, there were quite a few uh, issues they identified saying if we end up as an Auckland Council in Auckland Transport fixing some of these, uh, like Auckland um, Public Transport, that the ask for the congestion may be redundant. Thank you. And that's it. I suppose just to respond to that, in, in terms of yeah, working together and uh, I suppose the next... Yeah, Fundamentally, to do congestion charging in Auckland, it requires multiple agencies. So that's always been the premise of why we've worked together. You need legislative change in terms of what, what is, which is a primary government mandate. But they've made it very clear that without the support of Auckland Council, government would not do such legislation. It needs the support of council. And it also needs the involvement of Auckland Transport and Wakitaka, uh, NZTA, to ensure that we're all aligned. So that's why we're sort of working together. So for any final decision, you know, if, if say for example, in a world where Auckland Council didn't support, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the option to have the condition change in Auckland, it'd be very, uh, in my own, it'd be hard to see that government would go forward. So, that's, so we've got a key role in that final decision. Thank you, Councillor Philippina. And Councillor Casey. Do you know the wonderful thing about democracy is that Christine Fletcher and I represent the same ward and we'd probably be this far apart in terms of this particular issue. And uh, it might not be a question, I'll try and think of a question, but... Um, <laughs> Do you think? The uh, signing off ATAP, I didn't realise I was actually signing off an investigation into road pricing. So that was, that's, that's how far back this goes. So now this is more honest, but as far as I'm concerned, it's not honest enough because we haven't talked to the people of Auckland. And I just, I've seen the, the resolution that the chair has put up there that we're going to do some consultation. Well, that's fantastic. The people most affected by this are the people who think they've already paid for their petrol, their car and their roads. And the only way that you're, you're going to get more money out of me is, a, is if you know, it's a revenue gathering exercise, it's highway robbery. That's what, that's what I've heard my whole life. So if this was simply a cordon around the city centre, I could probably be talked into that because I'd like to see all the cars out of the city centre. So that would help. But I still remember Stephen Selwood coming to us back in 2017 and trying to sell us what was then called the motorway network charge, which I think that's what this is, but with different words. So motorway network charge. It's not, no, it's some kind, well, the, the, the motorways are included because he said State Highway 1 and State Highway 16 as one of the strategic corridor options, correct? So that is a motorway network charge. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, what the um, Infrastructure New Zealand proposed was uh, cumulative charges just on the motorways, which of course would just 
One would be very, very inequitable for the outer households. This is just a single charge. Uh, so, it, and, and, it, and, and the other problem with the uh, infrastructure in the zone proposal was that they, they weren't talking about charging arterial roads, which of course the only thing you're gonna do is then drive all the traffic from the motorways into your local communities. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do understand that. I was just putting that up as a, you know, that was the, the monster came out of the mist. The monster hasn't entirely gone back into the mist because I don't really understand the, the, the second part of this, which is a revenue gathering exercise. You are going to make money from it. You've said that, $200 million possibly. So that it is a revenue gathering exercise. So what I'd like to see now, I was so glad I heard the mayor yesterday on the radio talking about this is not coming anytime soon that before it comes, there has to be good alternatives. See, that's what these people who drive into our city haven't got. They haven't got choice. You might have talked to 50 people, and I don't know what they said to you, but I can guarantee you if you offered them an option, they would say no to a network charge of any kind. I, I, they've already paid. And I'm sure that's what they, you didn't say what they said to you, but I would, I would suggest that none of them are very keen on this idea. Because $7 when you're only getting a $7 cap, when you only get paid $20 an hour, is a hell of a lot of money. So you, you um, when you look at the mayor, the, the work hasn't been done yet, as the mayor has rightly pointed out, on the vast majority of people who can't afford to pay this. And my, that's, well, that's, where, that's where I'm interested in. So I'm not sure about this. I'm, I'm not sure. Would you like me to respond to that, or I mean, yes, in, in, in a couple of things. To, uh, it's really, I'd really invest the time having a look at the actual report on the MOT site of the 50 uh, people that was interviewed. And it's quite interesting, and the truth is, it's a bit mixed. For some people, it is a real burden and would be very difficult. For some people, it was wasn't such that wasn't the case. So uh, I think w w one of the challenges, I suppose, and th really thinking is that individually it does fall a bit different depending on the circumstance of, the, of those trips. That, that's the first thing. The other thing to think about in terms of, uh, I suppose, low-income road users is that the current conditions in terms of congestion has problems for them as well. In terms of access to jobs, often they're spending very long, more, more than what we think is ideal time in the car to a trip. One of the, one of the benefits of of these schemes is that the number of jobs coming available within a 30 minute drive increases. So in terms of access to opportunity, it does increase. There is a lot of psychological and stress benefits that come from congestion. So there's no doubt that, you know, there are issues that are for low income people now. But I suppose what I take out of this work, and this is the key thing that, that look, what, what it means for vulnerable users, which are low income people that cannot change the course of their behavior sort of thing, is that it needs to be front and mind of such schemes. So I suppose in terms of the final decision, that needs to be really thoroughly understood and debated. In terms of a discussion with Auckland, that's absolutely critical, and one of the recommendations going forward is that most of these schemes uh, do not go forward because of the public acceptability, primarily because they, they, a lot of people think they're unfair. So there needs to be quite a bit of discussion around that. But again, what's really interesting in terms of Stockholm, I suppose, at first some of the support was low, but post uh, the actual uh, implementation of the, the support went up a lot higher. So I, th I think, I suppose what, what this work is saying is that if you, you know, put the effort in, uh, there are ways you can look at these, uh, try to manage these issues. Complementary, in what way will you engage with the people of Auckland? What's the intention? Oh, that's that will be require. That's really the next work, I suppose. So, what we're what we're suggesting in in this resolution is that we this work gets scope, which includes how we would consult with the people of Auckland, and we bring that back to this committee and to government before we go forward, because that was what we really need to clarify. So we just haven't really got to that level of detail yet. So that's. <clears throat> That will be for us to confirm, Councillor Casey, and that's going to be absolutely critical. Can I just uh, follow up a supplementary to Councillor Casey, and maybe Brian or Jared, please contribute here. In the report, and then I did go and read most of the technical report, which is 140 pages, it, it talked quite regularly about modest impacts. There were, there were social impacts, but they, they were modest. Maybe you can just expand on that. But also the question of it being a revenue gatherer. The report, the technical report, makes it really clear that you cannot implement a revenue gathering scheme. There is revenue collected, 
And there's a, but there's a difference between a so-called revenue gathering scheme. Now, London was introduced as a congestion pricing and busting <laughs> scheme. It's unfortunately changed to a revenue gathering scheme. Stockholm has not done that. Gothenburg not. Singapore not. Can you just explain the difference between um, what's occurred in London, where they've now gone for revenue, having started not like that, and Stockholm and the others that have maintained uh, the primary focus being congestion, um, behaviour change rather than revenue gathering? Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, yeah. I mean, I think our objective, if you think about it, if you, if you, have, a, if you have the objective of basically of improving uh, network performance outcomes as opposed to revenue, then your goal is going to be to set the lowest possible charge to meet your network performance outcomes. Now, we've, we've suggested that the sort of school holiday impact, which is sort of an 8 to 12 percent uh, improvement in network performance using a bunch of different metrics, is realistic for Auckland. Uh, Gothenburg was, was, was very similar. They had a similar uh, PT mode share. Our mode share for some corridors is actually very high now. It, you know, it, it's, 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 get, it's approaching 50% for public transport and, and active modes. And so, so, so what we're proposing with the phasing is that the, essentially the, the introduction follows the capacity. Um, but but the, other, the other interesting thing, um, is that uh, if you look at, you know, uh, particularly in Sweden, which of course they've got the best data there being, being uh, Swedish, um, you know, it, it, essentially a huge number of trips, as David alluded to, just simply disappeared. Um, so there was about a, out of 20 percentage points, about nine, I think, switched to, to public transport. And then, you know, uh, two or three changed time, and the, the balance just disappeared. And so if you think about it, in, all, in the Auckland context, you know, we have a lot of, um, you, know, you know, there is still a lot of discretionary trips. And so the, the, the scheme, uh, you know, is, is, is about targeting those, not targeting uh, people who are essentially un unable to, um, uh, you know, to shift mode or time. Um, and, and whereas a, a revenue gathering scheme would, of course, be just looking to essentially target people with essentially a, a very low price elasticity in economic terms. So just going forward, I think it's really important that we get it clear. We are not developing a revenue gathering scheme, even though we are collecting revenue. And I think in the scoping, we need to, uh, we need to give some certainty that we won't end up like London becoming a revenue gathering congestion pricing scheme. Now, that's going to be subject to future decision makers that sit around these tables. But I, I think it's something that we need to examine uh, okay. in the next stage. Just to reinforce that, uh, Chair, I suppose when the original terms of reference was put together, demand management was the purpose, the clear purpose for this uh, project. It's never been a revenue gather gathering type uh, uh, aim. OK. Councillor Collins, I'm, I'm very conscious that you've got a meeting commitment elsewhere. Um, are you with us now online? And would you yeah. like to pose your question, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And so I think my questions have all been summed up. And, and um, so I'll, I'll just make a quick comment. Thanks. I think the Mayor summed it up because the question I was going to ask was about how the, there's a difference in, I guess, kind of income thresholds between a low income worker who'd be using the roads and the person who holds a community services card. So um, yeah, that, that's a question we'll need to consider. And I like your, um, I, I think it's your uh, recommendation, if that's gone into the considerations too. So yeah, I, I'm glad that the discussion's been had. I, I need to be convinced because I am extremely weary of the social impacts, which have already been talked about by, as alongside the Mayor Councillors, Casey and Philippe Baina. So thanks for the opportunity. I've enjoyed the discussion. I remain a little bit weary, but I'm glad that you've got um, F in there, sir, because because it's really going to help the next report if this goes through to really drive home a, a clear understanding of the social uh, and social economic impacts for those uh, more vulnerable commuters. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins, and thanks for staying with us. Uh, Councillor Henderson, please. Thanks. Just before I ask my questions, we're coming back to comments after questions, I take it? 
Uh, yes, and I've, I've taken a few comments because I'm conscious that um, uh, some councillors okay. needed to drop off the line. That's cool. Um, all right, well, I reserve my right to speak. Um, we're putting a lot of, uh, with respect, putting a lot of uh, stock in Stockholm. How, what's their public transport coverage like in Stockholm? It's, a, it, it's about, uh, I think their mode share is close between 20 to 25%. But, but equally, they achieved a 20 to 25 re percent uh, uh, reduction in traffic. So, to give you some context, so think so. Gothenburg had a mode share which is similar overall to to Auckland, and they achieved about a 12, 13 percent improvement in, in in network performance. So there is a correlation. Okay, I, I just mean in terms of physical coverage. I've seen maps of Stockholm's public transport network. I just looked it up. Doesn't look like Auckland, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and, just... and we're not saying that we're looking to to achieve what what Stockholm achieved. Okay. Cool. Um, just a couple of other questions supplementary. Uh, paragraph twenty nine in the report. Is there any reason why you did not mention the northwest? I don't, was it? Oh, yeah. uh, definitely when we wrote the report, we, there's no real reason for not mentioning it, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that be... the, the, it's not an exhaustive list yeah. of uh, all the public transport. I, I did, earlier, Shane confirmed a, a list, but we didn't actually go into the active transport program. Or there, there, like there was no intention to, um, sorry. And, and the mayor did mention it, Shane and Linda. <laughs> Merely asking intention and the question has been answered. I can, I can answer that for you. The report was actually finished before the shovel ready. It's been sitting for a long period of time, that report. Um, and uh, obviously the interim improvements were announced in July or something like that. Um, it turns northwest. So this report was authored, that's interesting, I didn't prepare this question, this report was authored before we had any solution on the North West, is that true? Yes, a lot of the work has been done over a period of two years. It's been an ongoing piece of work. I, I'm stunned, I might need to move on. <laughs> okay, um, just one last question. You have suggested that people need to start thinking about whether they need to drive to the city and peak. Would you accept that people are doing it already? They're already thinking that? D definitely people are, have already responded. And, you know, and that's why I always say to people when they ask me about rat running, and I'm like, well, it, you know, rat running, it's already happening. It, you, you know, people have already trying to work, work that out. And of course, again, that's why we're looking for, you know, our first objective is just that low hanging fruit. I mean, you probably may, may not have seen the latest census data, but a full 50% of 17-year-olds are now driving to school. You, you know, the, 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 there's no wonder there's a school holiday effect. You know, do they need to be driving to school at peak periods? You know, I think the answer is probably most of them don't. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, if the cost of motoring is, is very, very low, then obviously people are still going to be prepared to, um, you know, travel at peak periods, if, even when they don't need to. Thanks, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Dalton, please. Thank you. Um, look, I support the recommendations, but, uh, specifically C, which is moving to the next phase or scoping. I wondered if there might be a further opportunity to submit thoughts uh, for the um, scoping document. I, I can see that you've covered off a couple that have been raised under E and F. I just think that sounds like people have more thoughts around that or it would be good to have the information before bringing it back to us and then we relitigate it all again. David, can I just go to you on the scoping document? So uh, if you go down to the G members, um, G, yes, we'll, we'll have regular reporting. If it's, if, if, even if there is nothing for us to learn that requires a decision, we'll get um, an update via memo. So this is about staying over the top of it politically. We will. On the scoping document? Look, uh, the, the, the process for scoping has just begun and there's been some quite a bit of work done in the past. So, look, uh, I'm sure that as we get closer to, uh, you know, agree, wanting to agree the scoping, I mean, if 
if it's, you know, we could have a workshop or we, we could we'd have a way to get some input before, very open. Because, you know, it was interesting before I had a, just a talk to the uh, IMSB uh, chief executive was quite keen to have input into the scoping as well. So, look, I'll, I'll go back and say that, you know, we, we're building some opportunities to input into it. We, the answer is we will. Okay. Yeah, I did have another question. Um, in the documents that are on the transport website, is there one uh, outside of the 50 people that you interviewed that gives an indication of who who are travelling to town? To the city border? Uh, yep, I think the question. Uh, it's in the options development uh, there's an office development paper and there's a whole lot of supporting material and it's it's got it in there. I think it breaks it down from memory by local board in terms of the, the splits of who's coming to the city centre. In terms of who, does it identify uh, um, students, working people, travel, couriers, that, that level? I'm just trying to get to what the, the Mayor was talking about, about and um, Councillor Casey, who is driving into the city centre. I mean, since we finished this report, the new census data has been has been released. I mean, obviously there was some issues around the census data, but but it, it nevertheless has still got a lot of uh, updated materials. Um, that forms the basis for rebasing the Auckland forecasting uh, traffic model. So I think that uh, we will be in a, a better position. Having said that, uh, the model we built to do the social assessment, we modelled, you know, every household in Auckland by uh, size and income and and characteristic. Uh, so so we have that baseline data and, and the model that's been built I mean, that, that will need updating. But uh, it, it, it's surprising actually how short the journeys are. You know, there, there's, there, there's actually not a lot of long distance commuting happening in Auckland relative to other, other urban centers. The, the, the average size trip is, uh, the average length trip is only 12 kilometers. But 50 full 50 percent of trips are less than five kilometres, and again, all that data is in the technical report. And you will need to trend some data from the impacts of COVID and people not coming into the centre anymore, working from home. For, for sure, I mean, there, there's definitely been an impact. Um, uh, I think that some of that will be sustained, um, but you've obviously got a, a context of, of, of a growing city. Again, Auckland doesn't have a huge in out CBD kind of pattern. Uh, we, we're only talking about 15% of, of, of jobs and, 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 and actually a relatively small number of trips uh, compared to the trips that are being taking place across the whole network. That's why if we, if we wanna make this be very effective, we need to kind of go to some kind of strategic corridor scheme. That's what, that's what happened in Singapore as they evolved the scheme, they started off with the quite a smaller CBD-based scheme, but they've, they've moved it out towards the, the, the corridors, and they, so they target a, 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 a preferred uh, travel time and, and, and speed. That's really interesting. Um, Chris, I just have one comment, and then you don't have to come back to me, and it's around the revenue-generating uh, aspect of it, because the, any income that's generated is hypothecated to replace the work that's been done by the regional fuel tax and also perhaps public transport improvements. I think it's important that that, is, that story's told very well, but in addition to that, the report on a cost-benefit analysis on the transport website talks about the six benefits, and they are important because they must be pretty much top of mind of people, so the benefits are travel time, travel reliability, reduction in congested travel time, vehicle operating costs, CO2 emissions, and other emissions. That's the goal. That's, that's the end game, and I think that is what needs to be promoted as strongly as possible, although, of course, people will be looking at it as a revenue-generating exercise. Um, how do we tell that story a bit better? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dalton. Councillor Watson? Yeah, I'd just um, like to thank you for a very clear presentation. I mean, remarkably clear and uh, concise and, and, and in its own way quite persuasive. Um, my, my, my question, the first question goes to uh, those parts of Auckland that might be paying tolls. So, for instance, we've got a couple of projects where, you know, people are paying tolls. Does, does that 
do they, those communities get built into the $7 limit for the day or do they pay their $7 limit and then, then their toll on top of that? Good question. Um, we haven't uh, factored that into the analysis, um, but I think that's, I think if there was an extension, I'm thinking um, uh, Whangapau Row, obviously, uh, the bridge out there. Um, yeah, I, th I think that would be, we, we would need to talk about that. Uh, I mean, so generally speaking, we weren't thinking that we would, you know, the, the, the motorways would be, would be included in the first instance, um, but but, but I think if you move to a, a, a more geographically dispersed scheme, then yeah, that's a very valid point. Just, uh, just in, in, in terms of that data, you know, that um, uh, and the suggestion that how nuanced this might actually be once you start looking at, you know, individual families and, and where they might come from. I mean, o on the face of it, if you, if you look at someone who was getting caught with the $7 limit, you know, uh, at thirty-five dollars a week or whatever, fifty weeks of the year, you, you know that's like seventeen fifty. Yeah, one person. If there's a couple of people in that family, then it's you know it's up to three thousand five hundred, which starts to get get you know real big time. Um, the the regional fuel tax comparison, you know that that I don't know that that's probably maybe five dollars a week or or in the vicinity of that per per household member. So there's a big there's a huge big big gap there. I guess, um, you know, being being a representative of one of the, the further out wards, which you know, might be, be be conceivably hit harder by this, um, how how are you going to get, um, you know, and I'm thinking in terms of the, the public con consultation, the that nuanced effect that might occur from people altering their behaviour. So, so we, we do want down this is about altering behaviour. How how do we get that built in to the the consultation and, and and the realistic assessment back from people then of how it will affect them? Because clearly, if you've got people affected to that worst case, that's you know that's just unfair and prohibitive. But if we take in, well, we want you to change your behaviour. You have to change your behaviour. This isn't about money. It's about our city going forward. How, how do we get that built into someone's response to us in terms of, well, actually, I don't need to go to work to half past nine or whatever, really, and, and that's what I would do. So it seems to me to be a real challenge to, to, to get a, a real effect, uh, a sense of how the effect might be and how it might not be as bad as perhaps is being suggested. Maybe I can respond to that a bit. I mean, I think the first part of that in terms of consultation, and I think the report does outline some key principles of what the scheme is trying to do and some of the key things that would be applied. And I suppose one of them is, it goes, you know, is around having the PT alternatives. So, I mean, what, as Brian has mentioned, the scheme is not there to penalise people who cannot change their behaviour. I think this is the big thing we have to get through to the public. It's to make people think before they get in uh, their vehicle, do they really need to do this trip sort of thing? So that's that's what this was all about. And a lot of the time, as Brian said, with a lot of these discretionary trips, it turns out, and the Stockholm shows this, actually people didn't need to make it at that time or whatever. So it changed. So I think there's a, there are some additional principles that we need to apply. It has to be very clear that it's, you know, you're not aiming at penalising people who honestly cannot change their behaviour. This is what not about. So that's, that's come through quite strongly. And I suppose, you know, it... It, it, then it's really trying to say that for those who can, who really can't change their behaviour and it's going to affect you, there is things that can help mitigate that. So I think there's quite an important story around that. And, and so in terms of, I suppose, you know, for people that are further out in the region, I think having the fact that these alternatives, until you have these alternatives, they wouldn't, wouldn't be applied is a part of that story because you... You know, you, you, we want to have people options. This is part of giving them options to make that decision. It's not a scheme, like a, re a revenue raising scheme would be, you have no options, we just take the revenue. So it's, you have to get that, but that's the trick, I suppose. But you're right, it's going to take some good thinking how to explain that, because, you know, the first reaction to a lot of people would be, oh, I can't change behaviour, um, it's, it's going to really hurt me. But overseas, the experience shows that often they do, and they can't even remember the previous behaviour with time. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Councillor Walker. Yeah. 
So, um, got a few questions, um, no particular order. Um, I guess commendation. In one general context, um, quite obviously, this, I, this sort of move also applies to power, applies to water. We've got peak issues across Auckland with everything. So in principle, I think there's a larger setting. Uh, the other concern that I've got um, that I put to you as a question is just around um, you know, climate emergency, switching to EVs, uh, making the assumption that you've identified that obviously if you're identifying a number plate, that correlates with whether it's uh, an EV, a hybrid, or whatever. Um, so it's useful to have some commentary around that. The other concern that I've got that just goes to the context around PT um, alternatives, um, the other substitute for a trip is communications, because if somebody can work at home, if they can communicate, it's a direct substitute for travel. So the larger context is, for example, if you're looking at smart cities around free Wi-Fi and other things. So I think it's implicit to actually have that information in the alternatives. And then the other issue um, around Auckland, as various people have identified, is there are chunks of Auckland that don't have access to public transport. So if you look at my era with Councillor Watson, uh, some of those people, a lot of them are dependent on park and rides, but park and ride capacity is limited and we're not expanding it. So is that sort of um, issue going to be confronted in terms of the public transport alternative? And then the other larger context is essentially this whole issue is around promoting choice. We're applying a stick to um, do that. But the other thing ar around choice, particularly in the sort of te technological and communication-based society we've got, is we could be applying a lot more information around choice. So when is it quicker to travel because there isn't a, a peak congestion um, problem? Um, information around car sharing and, and other things. So there's a bundle of things that we could and should be doing that go to this that I just um, toss in. And then the related question I've got that has to be of concern to the government is with what is inevitable around a massive shift to EVs, how is government going to collect revenue? So what is the mechanism that government is going to use to collect revenue from people driving vehicles because that's an incredibly important source of revenue and how does that tie in with this, not just for Auckland but New Zealand as a whole. So a few questions there, I don't need any answers necessarily but if you can just pick up on them that's useful, thanks. Uh, David, primarily uh, I'm sure you take Look, some notes I suppose there. And, yeah, uh, I think one of the findings of the work was uh, you know, the Travel demand management uh, has, you know, a number of facets to it. And uh, when we did the option analysis, we did look at a range of more transport orientated uh, other mechanisms like PT fares, uh, you know, car sharing. So I suppose, you know, the, uh, while this work has been more focused than some what you've been talking about, Councillor, you know, it would be part of this travel demand management package. So I think that, that, that's good uh, thoughts there. And in terms of uh, how it links into broader uh, government uh, work, well, I am aware that the Ministry of Transport is doing a future of transport revenue sort of project, which is, I suppose, trying to think about uh, some of these more fundamental factors where, you know, the, uh, which is really a substitution away from fossil fuel vehicles sort of thing. So while there's been some connection and awareness of that, it hasn't been a primary part of this project. Mm. Thank you, David. And Good points, and we need to collate those uh, points of feedback, please. Uh, Councillor Stewart, please. <clears throat> Thank you. A lot of the questions I was going to ask have been asked, but um, lack of car parking in, in the CBD, we seem to be getting rid of a lot of car parking, and so a lot of, a lot of people that I speak to are um, uh, thinking about taking their businesses out of, out of um, the CBD and, and Parnell, I know my daughter works in, in Parnell, and what, what happens in, in the, the business that she's working in, there's, I don't know, about 100 staff or something like that, or more, and every two hours they all have to go, because, because of the lack of car parking, 
they have to go and move their cars. So every two hours, one of them will say to the Mary next door, hey, Joe's just moving his car, you go down, then um, Jonathan, you better go down and you, you better go and move your car. And so what's happening is, um, you know, people are all having to, so a lot of people, this congestion, you know, I'm not totally against congestion charging. I many years ago lived in Singapore and experienced the early part of it. But I am really concerned that a lot of people are now not wanting to work in the CBD as much. And I think, you know, looking at Commercial Bay, I just heard on the radio just last night, people were saying that Commercial Bay is really, really struggling because people aren't wanting to come into the CBD because they can't get car parking or car parking is now getting too expensive. So if we're going to start having congestion charging and, you know, all these things, it's, good, it's just going to be... So I'm just pointing that out because it, it's very, very real. And I think what will end up happening if we're not careful with the CBD, if we take all the car parking away and we make it really, really expensive for everybody and everybody has to be, keep running in and out, you know, you just imagine us all having to run in and out every couple of hours to, to move our cars. Um, people are going to move out of the CBD and it'll only be people that are living in the CBD and you won't have any congestion charging because they'll all be just walking around and riding their bikes and their scooters. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like a good future. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Mr Chair, and thanks, David and team. Great presentation, and um, I really enjoyed it. The, the question I think a lot of it has been answered. You know, this is a zero sum game. So we start off with a CBD, so they're doing 75 million bucks a year as a cordon. Then we cut the fuel tax in half. And as we grow it out, so our fuel tax continues, it gets cut, but it disappears. That's the basic principle, is it not? Yeah. yeah. That's so, right. I mean, as, as the mayor indicated, I mean, obviously, it is, that is a decision for the committee at the, at, in the final decision. But, you know, one option you have is that as you raise revenue from a congestion scheme, you would reduce your regional fuel tax to ensure that there was you know, parallel reduction. That's an absolutely key principle. When people were going ape on social media about this when it got out public earlier this week, I put it back and said it's a zero-sum game, guys. It comes off fuel tax. One guy came back who was being really vociferous and just said, oh, that's OK then. So yeah. that was quite, <laughs> was quite an amusing thing. The other point that hasn't been brought up here is, what if we don't do this? So Shane, you know, the road transport's going, still going up faster than PT. And what would it cost to double deck the southern or the, or the western or the northern motorways? It's it's a big number, Deputy Mayor. We don't have enough noughts in my calculator to figure that no. out. No. So There's a presentation coming in a minute which will give you a sense of um, which will give you a sense of uh, why we need this on top of the ATAP investment. In terms that's of, where I'm going. So the rationale yeah. behind this is it's, it's actually an inevitability because we, we have to do something like this to get the congestion down and improves people's quality of life and improves productivity. Not doing it and being in denial is not an answer because it will get to a point where we have traffic Armageddon, and some places we have that now, that we just grind the whole place to a shuddering halt. And even Dallas and Fort Worth learned that lesson, didn't they? So. Um, the challenge is going to be in the comms and getting the public understanding level to rise. And if people's and companies change where they operate their business from, their business will still operate. They'll just be somewhere else where they find it more preferable because there is a less congested environment. That's probably might be good for Councillor Watson's uh, uh, mayor. It might be good for mine as well. Um, quite happy for having that happen. Uh, a bit more regional economic activity. In fact, there's more people live and work in the south now than what they do in the CBD by quite comes to some considerable margin. The other last point I'd make of a relation of mine rings me up about once, or you should me up about once a week, and they were driving through at 25 past eight from Oraki, Koei Marimara, I think he lives, through Mission Bay, and ring me up and give me an absolute earful about the congestion. And I'd say, Charlie, don't ring me up on your bloody car phone when you're driving on Mission Bay at peak hour traffic on your own in your car, because Charlie, you are the bloody problem, clunk. <laughs> and um, Charlie did stop ringing up after a while, but. Uh... <laughs>
Charlie's not a constituent. <laughs> no, 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 unfair of me. Good on you. Uh, Councillor Cooper, please. Thank you. Um, one of my questions is when we talk about having exemptions because of different levels of either socio-economic or area, how hard is it to create a system where you have lots of exemptions? You know, because we know that things like GST, everyone says the best system is the simple one-off system. Uh, thanks. That's a that's a good question. Our, our, um, if you when you get a chance to read the report, we were very much actually uh, our, yeah. our first principles mm -hmm. is that we, we are trying to avoid exemptions. That's what's undermined the London scheme, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. And and so what we're talking about it's really you know ex post mitigations uh, and. Sorry. Well, you know, after people have made those decisions, after people have, have, have paid, uh, as opposed to creating exemptions. So the only, at the moment, the only vehicles, classes we're talking about being exempt are essentially passenger transport vehicles, uh, motorcycles, scooters, bikes. Okay, so I've, I've got a couple of other questions, but I am going to comment because actually we're all getting really hungry and we've still got a big meeting to go. Um, so for me, one of the issues when we talk about a, a vulnerable people is we talk about people on low incomes. I'm actually more concerned about young professional people who have get driven further and further out. Um, you know, they're paying... I just Somebody just sold a house, just a little old house... It's in West Harbour, but 1.57 million, you know, these are considered first homes, 20-odd um, K out of Auckland, the, to the hilt on their mortgage, it's not how much they earn, it's what disposable, in, what income is left. And we're not taking into account those young people who are trying, haven't even had, I can't even have a baby yet, can't do this, just trying really hard. But we, we never talk about those people. Those are our... Young, younger people who are kind of our future. Um, so we're not even factoring them in, but they're the ones that are paying the taxes, they're doing all that, they're going to be paying rates, they're paying, they're paying the mortgages. doesn't matter how much interest rates they are, they're pushed to the hilt on two incomes. And so that's what I worry about. Plus, um, some of them are living in areas with, you know, they might live in Avon, I just looked, live in Avondale, but work at the airport or in that precinct, um, it's nearly an hour and a half on the bus. They either have to go all the way into town and then all the way out to the, or all the way through only hunger to get an alternative. The alternatives aren't even appealing, but we're talking about a network charge, so that would be they normally might go through the tunnel or down a motorway or go down the northwestern motorway if they live in Massey. And those are the things that I'm not feeling that I feel confident. Um, the, the people that presented to us earlier, he just texted me his plan for light rail. He said it will be there in 2040 up the northwestern, 20 years away. You know, so I, I'm kind of not confident that if we had the net, whole network charge, you say we'll do it in the end, but we, we're not, you know, and, and, and Shane has done some really good work with his staff on a northwestern busway, but it's still not great. It's still really inadequate, and it's not a viable choice for a lot of people. Um, so that's the things that I, I mean, I will vote for this to go out and have all this work done, but it's gonna take a lot of convincing for me that the people that I represent, and particularly Massey, Northwest, people like that in, in, in the southwestern part of Upper Harbour that are actually going to see any benefit. Um, it's just going to cost them more because they're pushed out further, the younger people, to buy a house. Um, I'm not worried about the people that are on the, you know, pretty much on, on some sort of benefit because they're not going to make these trips. You know, that it, they don't pay, and if they live in housing New Zealand, they don't pay rates. But it's these people. The other thing that I'm not comfortable with, we talk about phasing in and phasing of fuel tax. For me, it's one or the other. Because while you're still forced with no decent RTN to go into the city or use the network, you're, you're going to be paying that charge and you're paying fuel tax. So, 
you know, I feel incredibly let down by the whole fuel tax thing because it hasn't delivered what I voted for, which was RTN in the northwest. It's supposed to be all happening by 2021, where December 2020, you know, so I, to me, it's just another impost for people that don't have a choice. And so that's, unless there's another choice, it'd be hard for me to support it. But I'm interested in seeing this extra work. Um, you know, it's a really good piece of work, but it's just, it's still going to disadvantage people. And it won't just be the lowest income. It's really around people with the least amount of spare money to do anything with. And we're seeing with the house, house prices, the people that do get in the market, they're, they're to the hilt already. Thank you. And look, uh, the Deputy Mayor just, uh, he articulated it quite well. There's an expectation that if the first phase comes in, the, the revenue gathered from that would be offset by a reduction in the regional fuel tax immediately, immediately. Um, and so we'll explore that through the scope uh, as we progress things. I want to go to Councillor Simpson, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. A couple of quick questions. CRL, all things being equal, 2024. So you have a year of CRL without a congestion charge. How long does it take um, for behaviour? So first of all, the CRL opens and then you'll get people getting ready to use the CRL and then they'll start using it and that'll, you know, build it and they will come sort of scenario. Then if you put the congestion charge on, when will you expect to see the change? C certainly it's not immediate, is it? Well, it's quite interesting because I suppose, you know, the, the, in terms of a price, I suppose, you'd, you'd imagine the change would be quite quickly because the way I, you know, you think about it very basically, if uh, you had one day where uh, a supermarket, everything was free, You'd have a lot of queues in there. The next day, all the prices went on. Things have changed reasonably quickly. So I think the anticipation is that you do get results quite quickly because it really goes to the essence of, uh, you know, human behaviour. If you know that you're going to face a charge before you get in your car, uh, you probably, the first little while, go, OK, well, I'll probably get around that. But when you realise you can't get around it, then the behaviour will change. So my expectation is that you'd have quite a rapid change. So is that based on your opinion or what's happened elsewhere oh, when it's come in overseas? Yeah, the, the, the changes that have happened overseas happen immediately. Thank you, that's the answer. My second question is the engagement with Aucklanders. Um, do we as councillors have an opportunity to input into what and how that looks like? So if you look at the, um, where is it, the E, so this is, this is the scope that we talked about before, um, and David and the team, remember, we're dealing with a number of agencies here, um, government and council, will be developing that scope up and we'll be checking in on that scope. So the, the engagement plan, um, we'll get to have a look at that, and the G mentions that there's going to be quite regular reporting on this. It's important that we stay, as I said, politically right over the top of it. OK, that, enough questions, and there have been great questions. And um, look, at the outset, I really want to thank David. You've uh, just taken us through this journey here today in a, a brilliant way, actually. Uh, Azim, not forgetting your writing of the report, um, and um, in a PwC, Auckland Transport, um, through Brian. Um, look, I'm just really, really grateful for the, the thoroughness of the, the, not just the report, but everything that sits under this report. Um, look, I can't help but think, you know, we're, in Auckland, we're, we're at a point where it's unsustainable to continue building roading infrastructure to the extent that we have. We've seen it as the solution. Uh, we are at a point now, uh, while we recognise the significant benefits of that infrastructure spend, and there are great benefits, um, these all come with mega, not million, but mega billion price tags. And um, they come and impose uh, tremendous costs. And those costs include tremendous social costs, because it is the Aucklanders, be they ratepayers or taxpayers, who are bearing those costs. So there are already unbearable social costs that Aucklanders are suffering under. Um, in the coming five to ten years, my view is we're probably going to be at what I would term peak infrastructure. 
there is nowhere else to go in terms of a particularly road building. Efficient PT, we will still be embarking on. But also the revenue sources, they're unsustainable. We know that. We know that the National Land Transport Fund going forward is oversubscribed and its sources of revenue, road user charges, excise duties, etc., cetera, uh, they're under threat by new technologies, e.g. electric vehicles. So we've got challenges there. Environmentally, it's unsustainable, totally environmentally unsustainable to follow this course that we are on expecting just infrastructure to solve our problems. So we're in a spiral. We need to correct that spiral. We need to some step change to break us out of that spiral. And uh, this is the tool, amongst others, but we've known about this tool for some 20 years. This is demand management. We've known for 20 years that the best transport dollar you can spend is a demand management dollar. And, but we've failed to really take a move, make a move on that. So um, the opportunity costs are enormous. Uh, now imagine what we could do for Aucklanders if we deferred mega billion dollar spend or cancelled mega billion dollar spend. We wouldn't have to rate and, and tax them to the same extent. So there are upsides here. But I think of the government, and I think we've got to convince the government that they've got a massive infrastructure program that could possibly take that spend, like a broken down health system, where our people are struggling to be uh, you know, dealt with in a hospital system because it's not fit for purpose. Imagine if the opportunity cost was one in favour of government spending on its core needs. Um, I'm not suggesting that we should be deferring or cancelling the critical uh, transport infrastructure program for Auckland. The Waitamata Harbour Crossings project identified a five to twenty billion dollar uh, spend to address Waitamata, Waitamata connections. It's phenomenal. Now, if you, I think in that report it referred to a possible five-year deferral of that if congestion pricing was in place. So that the, the upside. I don't shy away from the social impacts, but I think we also need to dwell on tremendous upside here. So it is, it's imperative that we lead this. We need to give confidence to government and its agencies that we're on board for this. Without that, uh, they are not going to be up for it. So today is about sending a signal to government that we are up for it. That is to continue it to the next stage. I'm not suggesting that we're going to land it. But we need to do it with them jointly, um, and we need to show a bit of strength and a bit of spine in doing that, because it will be an uncomfortable ride in some respects. Um, but we will undertake really deep community engagement, particularly with Māori. We will look at those social impact assessments again, and we will find the solutions to those. We will deliberately find the solutions. So um, let's do this. And let's do it well, and I've, I've heard a, a really good, solid engagement here today that I'm sure our staff and all the agencies and government can get a sense that we're on board to progress this. And I again come back to uh, David and the, our team and all the agencies, Auckland Transport, uh, thank you for your most comprehensive work. Meg off. Oh, very, very briefly. There are some hungry looking people around this table. Um, and I, I concur with your comments, uh, Mr. Chair. Look, um, we're spending billions on infrastructure. And I was asked um, by an investigative reporter, uh, will this lower congestion? And the best I could say is that with a growing population, uh, probably it will hold congestion. Um, so we have to do something on demand management. And you know the arguments are very clear in terms of huge productivity cost to the city, a couple of billion dollars, very clear in terms of the total frustration. And the deputy mayor and I have to travel in probably the longest distances and you know wasted hours. Um, we need to deal with um, the emissions and we, we really have to have a, a situation where we actually accelerate mode change. And we know this will do it. But I want to finish up with this. 
there are four prerequisites. I'm trying to pick up comments from people like Councillor Casey. First, we have to look after the working low-income people. Secondly, we need to um, make sure that this is not revenue gathering, and it's not it's not its prime purpose. Its prime purpose is to decongest. So it phase out of regional fuel tax, phase in of congestion tax. Um, thirdly, um, we absolutely um, need to consult with the people uh, of the city. Um, we can't do this, actually, unless we've got a degree of public support, a mandate to go forward, a social, a social licence. So you guys have done the, the hard mahi, and you've done it really well. Uh, now it's up to us. And the, the last point I'll just make, this process began under a national government, and at least the previous spokesperson for the National Party said that he approved of it. It was continued under a Labor government. I've talked to the Minister of Transport and the Prime Minister. They they are cautious, uh, but they understand the need for demand management. The Greens favour it because of its environmental impact, and ACT favours it because it's the user pays. So you've actually got um, a broad spectrum of the political parties. Now we have to have a broad spectrum of the public to get in behind us. But thank you for the work, and I support the recommendations. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Henderson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've got quite a few thoughts on this, so I'll try and be as brief as I can. Um, but congestion charging, I, I do support one part of the report there where it needs to be used for public transport, because briefly we've got three huge problems with public transport in this city. There is not enough in existing routes. There is more needed for new routes, such as places like the Northwest and the Waitaku Ranges. And there needs to be funding to do all this stuff, including providing workers with good wages. We need to attack all three of those problems to get a good modern system of transport together. Um, and just endorse the comments before, this is a regressive charge. It will affect lower income people and lower income workers more. And it needs good design to try and overcome that regression. I don't know how we're going to do this, but that's how we, we work on this in future stages. And that includes students as well. Um, let me just talk about this. I did mention this earlier. Equity issues for 100,000 people from the northwest. That's what we're talking here. And I am stunned to find stunned to find that this report was written before we had a solution to the northwest, and the northwest itself was not mentioned in the report. That that's shocking to me. They live in public transport poverty up there, and something needs to be done to even consider this kind of charge before it's viable for our city. If we were to put this on today, as it was expressed earlier by previous speakers, it would operate as a messy tax. That's what it would be, a messy tax, nothing more, nothing less. In Henderson Massey, there are only 32 local jobs for every 100 residents. And in the Waitaku Ranges, it is 17 jobs for 100 residents. We should be incentivising people and actually providing a carrot as well as a stick um, not to drive through local town centre investment through local jobs that are available before we can penalise those that, where they have no viable choice. Commute times for West Aucklanders are out of whack as well. We spend an extra hour per week travelling than the Auckland average to get to work. That's crazy. That's an hour out of your life per week that you could be spending with your family. So despite all of these concerns, I am planning to vote for it today. And I'm planning to vote for it because it says in there that we're going to ask the public. And I want to hear what the public have to say about this. At this stage, I have a fairly dim view of it, on it until we get the necessary situation in place. And one more thing about Stockholm. I've looked this up. Stockholm have 153 train stations, and I didn't find the light rail. That was only the metro. We've got, was it 45, 46, somewhere in there? Um, so I think we need to be honest with the public when we're looking at overseas examples. So I'm planning to vote for it, and let's ask the public, and I'll listen to my instructions from my ward carefully and from Aucklanders carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson and Councillor Hills. Thank you. And I sort of have a similar view as Councillor Henderson and others, that I'm sceptical at this time that we um, are even considering putting this in place without good options for all or many. Um, my community is blessed with 
access to good public transport. And it's shown in the last seven years of the census that we have more than doubled public transport users. But that is because we've put good public transport in. There was no congestion charge, and maybe people got sick of congestion, but in the Northcote electorate, the, count, uh, the government electorate, we went from seventh ranked in the country for bus use to third ranked in the country um, for bus use. We more than doubled from 2,200 users uh, of a bus daily, based on the um, census, to seven years later, almost 6,000. Uh, the Devonport side, the North Shore, very high use of ferries because they've got access to it. Um, so I th at the moment, 16,500 um, workers from the North Shore ward come into the city every day, and more than 11,000 of those catch public transport. So phenomenal numbers, but it's not because of anything like this. It's because they have access to good public transport. When I was at uni in a, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, 12, 13 years ago, there, it was a bus every four, four, 40 minutes um, at peak, and it was actually more expensive to take the bus back then because it was um, cash. It was $4.50, and if you missed the bus, you missed your lecture, you just wouldn't go in, and they were horrible old buses. Now there's a bus every 10 minutes from my house. It's it's a dollar cheaper all this time later, and I know that they're good quality, comfortable buses. It's safe. You have young people, lawyers, people in their high-vis. Anyone is catching um, the bus from my ward because it's easy and affordable and makes sense. But there are places like Councillor Dalton's ward and Councillor Cooper's ward, um, Councillor Henderson's ward, that there is not the options. And yes, the numbers are lower that come into the city, but as Councillor Cooper says, there'll be more people driven out to outer suburbs of um, my age and below, especially trying to get on the housing ladder and still working in the city centre. So. Yes, this is a long, a long way ahead. It makes a lot of sense to try and prioritise, and we've seen that with a bridge disaster that people did once they sort of had no other option or found that public transport was the best option. I had people texting and calling me and saying how shocked they were how good the bus and ferry services were because they were not driving over the bridge to the city because the bridge was basically gridlocked, so they figured out that the ferry and bus services were far superior than they actually knew it was. So I get the point of a congestion charge, but I remember it when I was in London getting dropped off by my cousin uh, to Kentucky with our bags, but we had to go before 6.30 a.m. because it was about a 10 pound charge. It was pretty expensive, so it made sense. But they also had the most significant um, public transport that got started being built 200 years ago. So I guess it will be a bit fair to us. We've only started really 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> But but that was why it worked. Everyone knew that, okay, driving to the city centre in London doesn't make sense, but it does make sense to take the train because you have a train station at every single suburb across London. So I'm really sceptical right now that this is fair to put pressure in the back of people's minds when they're already finding it hard to live, work and play in this city. But because we're not confirming the exact mechanisms, and I assume and that a removal of the fuel tax, which kind of punishes everyone, um, not just the people causing congestion, um, would make sense. So I'll be supporting it going forward, but with the acknowledgement that there's a lot more work to do in the city and that not everyone is blessed like my community who has good public transport options. Um, so supporting the direction, I know it has good um, processes for, for climate change and others, but I do worry about our communities that we're kind of just pushing to the side um, when we keep putting these kind of ideas up. So um, public transport first for everyone. Thank you, Councillor Hills. And to close the debate, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I really am encouraged by what I hear today because I think we are going to have to back our officers and officials on this because this is one of the really hard debates that we have to have. So I, I'm heartened by what I hear and I don't think it's a debate we should shy away from. Um, financial considerations must be, and you know we've heard a lot of discussion around the equity issues today and that is utterly important. 
but I've heard less, and it's it's probably only Councillor Henderson that um, just touched on an issue that's really important to me. When we had COVID, the, the one thing that people talked about was more family time. The one thing that people, it touched their hearts that they could actually be free of the tyranny of congestion and run the bath, bathe the children, do the things that they were denied on a nightly basis. And I think of my own family in this situation. We don't really factor in what the social toll is on the stress, the emotions, the divorces, that everything else comes for those of us who have watched families being destroyed by congestion over the last 20 years. I'm not one of those who passionately believes that this is going to be a cure-all um, for, you know, there'll be no more roads needing to be built, there'll be no more this, this or that. This is just one of the ingredients, but, it, but it's the ingredient for those of you who are bakers in the room, it's the baking powder. It's the enabler that we can give if we are granted the statutory right to have that tool to be able to deal with things going forward. So um, I think it will change behaviour. Um, I am utterly convinced, having researched this for nigh on 20 years now, um, and I think the other thing for me is that the environmental outcomes that will come as a result of this take us again from just the rhetoric into the actual action. So I'm excited by it. I do want to back you as, as officers of council and, and board of Auckland Transport and to know that we can actually go out and have a meaningful debate with Aucklanders on the genuine benefits that will come from this. So thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really uh, applaud your willingness to allow us to, to deal with it fulsomely. It's a really important step in the progress of Auckland. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. I think that captures the sentiment and the great debate. I uh, acknowledge everybody. We'll go to the vote. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. And declare that carried. And um, I hear that there's no dissenting voices, so unanimous vote. Uh, now, we will uh, leave that item. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have got uh, extraordinary uh, item 16. There are no extraordinary items. Um, uh, which take... um, just, just if I may, there is a situation with Dominion Road, which I would like to bring to you. We don't need to debate it at the moment, but it was fast-tracked in terms of a shovel-ready development, and there are some significant issues, and I would hate to think that there is a precedent being established okay. here. So, I, if I may, can I just table my concern with the proposed development for 360 Dominion yep. Road and take it with you offline? Councillor Cooper, that's a regulatory matter. It's, um, you were, we're talking about 360 Dominion Road, a call-up, fast-track. So that's I think it's we, out of our hands because it's we well, only look, get rather your, than drop into yeah, the detail okay, now. I'm so very I conscious. Know, yeah, I just don't know what you're Councilor asking Fletcher's me. Councillor Fletcher's raised it. I, I need to redirect that. It's not a planning, but it is a regulatory. Can we have a conversation in the break? I need to. I also want to use the bathroom, so I'm very happy for <laughs> it to keep it brief. Procedural motion to exclude the public. I'll move accordingly. Can I have a second, Councillor Walker? All those in favour, say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Declare that carried. We are concluding this part. We're adjourning uh, for, can we make it 15 minutes? 20. To, uh, can we take a 20 minute break, please? No, we do need a break. We, we're having a lunch break. Okay, we're going to come back.